谁是朋友，谁是敌人？我们能否对周周问题而不自欺欺人？谁的盟友，谁的利润，是谁给予一份的争斗和牺牲 ？Welcome to another episode of the Silk and Steel podcast. I am your host Carl Zha. Today we will continue our series on the political history of Taiwan. As our guest,、uh, a Taiwanese communist rapper, Xiang Yu.、Uh, Xiang Yu, welcome to the show again. Hello, good to be back. It's been a while since our last recording. I think it's almost a month.、Um, what, what, what have you been up to? Not much, really. Just trying to get started on my next album, which isn't going too well so far. But I think I just need to push myself a little bit harder. And other than that, just my summer class. Can you、uh, reveal a little bit about what what your next album is going to be? It's I think it's the same as my other albums. It's just me rapping about you know、um, political issues about like imperialism and、um, class contradiction and stuff of that nature. Really interesting stuff, you know. Are there、really. are there going to be accompanying music videos too? That's the plan. I I think um with COVID money coming in, I'll have a bigger budget for my next album. And since I have increased work hours actually during this whole during this whole ordeal, hopefully I mean I've been I've been saving money. Nice, nice.、Uh, okay, that I remember. That's one of the reason why we have this、uh, long interruption because you you had increased work hours. So I'm glad you can make the time to join us once again.、Uh, I have been getting a lot of positive feedback on. Uh, the comments on my Patreon site about the series. So we cover, we manage to cover, you know, the Taiwan history from the prehistory all the way up to, I think, late seventies and early nineteen eighties. Last time,、uh, maybe、yes. we should do a quick recap for our audience just to catch them up, like refresh their memory, or for the people who haven't, who haven't really listened. Idea what we talk about, but I do recommend、uh, if you haven't listened to the other parts of the our Taiwan history series, I do recommend you go all the way back to the beginning. I will list the number of episodes in our show notes, and、uh, but but meanwhile, let's just do a quick recap. Yes. Okay. So um, I think for this to make sense, if you don't get anything in the recap, just remember this main um. Um, this main point: there are two. The Taiwanese population can be broadly divided into two groups, Bensengren、um, and Waisengren. And Bensengren means、um, people of this province, and it refers to everybody who was already, everyone whose、um, family was already in Taiwan by the time、um, Japan surrendered in World War II and the KMT,、um, and Taiwan was returned to China, which was under、um, control of the KMT at the time. And、uh, Waisengren are、um, the People from the, people whose families came from the mainland after 1945, and around between then until 1950s, and all of their descendants, and、um, you know, there's this sort of confusion among foreigners on oh, Taiwan is just like the origin story of Taiwan is like 1949 when Mao Zedong kicked、um, Chiang Kai-shek out of the mainland, and no, it's it's not really that simple, and this sort of、um, historical understanding kind of erases it erases all of the history before.、Um, Before the KMT was even a thing, before the Republic of China was a thing, and before the People's Republic of China was a thing, and then it leaves a lot of holes, which um, and it leaves a lot of、um, knowledge gaps, which makes it near impossible to understand what's going on today. So, Mike, our goal with this whole podcast is to fill in those holes. So, oh, and on、um, the Benson River, I have、Sorry? a quick question. So, do the indigenous population of Taiwan fall under? Benson, then do do they normally get included in the? Benson I was going to get to that. It's、oh, an interesting question you might ask because, well, technically they are, but、um, Taiwanese society is so Han centric that Benson then basically imply it's um, it's like okay, yeah, they they are when 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 we want them to, and they aren't when we don't want them. Whatever is convenient for like the opportunists, right? For those so for the people who are listening to the Taiwan series for the first time. Yes, there are indigenous、uh, population of Taiwan who have been living on the island since time immemorial. There are, are however, there have been a very mar- marginalized、uh, in, in Taiwan society.、Um, you know, there's they only compose a small percentage of population. I mean, the closest analogy I guess you can 
Jew is like the Native Americans uh, of the of the Americas of North America, particularly. Yes, and then there's also a lot of assimilation. Like the ones that are counted today are like the two percent figure counts as the ones who haven't been like totally assimilated. Right, right, because yeah. the process of um, Taiwan being settled by by uh, by Han settlers from the mainland that happened, uh, you know, over 400 years ago is that uh, as we talk about before, uh, the, the, the especially the first wave of migrants into Taiwan, they're mostly predominantly young male, right? And, and many of them take up indigenous wives and, and but their children kind of just adopted the high and then identity and they, they've been assimilated in that way. And yeah, also, there's also like some cross assimilation. Like if you go to their temples, you'll notice that like it's Chinese folk religion, but then some of their gods are like Aboriginal gods. Yes. Yeah. The little things like that. And um, it's so then, yes, there are indigenous people, but unfortunately, it's because of Ben Shengren, this sort of concept is so um, foreign to America that a lot of times they just translate it to natives. So then there's also this misunderstanding that, oh, the KMP just went and just displaced all of the indigenous people which is not really how it happened no no the indigenous people got marginalized and, and long and before the KMT even before. existed yeah exactly this is uh and and what I'm not saying it's right but it's not something that we should pin on the KMT is what I'm saying no no but what the we we covered this history in depth uh yes. in our earlier episode I highly suggest people go listen to them to learn how the how the process uh, uh, took place. Um, but you could, let's continue with our recap. Yes. So then, um, you know, you had Japanese colonization as a result of the um, Sino-Japanese War, and um, which ended in 1895, and Taiwan was a Japanese colony until 1945. You know, there were some... Um, there was like a process of... Um, there were multiple phases. The first phase was pretty much um, leave Taiwan's, like, Lee Taiwan's um, culture and stuff alone, but then in the last final years during the war, there was an attempt to try to um, um, Japify the Taiwanese people, but then it was it was really short lived, and but then it, it kind of plays a slight role in the in the KMT's attitudes towards Taiwan, which we're going to get into now. So, 1945, Taiwan was returned to China, and um, Chiang Kai Shek sent this dude named um, Chen Yi to serve as the chief executive of um, the Taiwan provincial government. And because of, you know, poor military discipline, government corruption, bad economy, you know, like hyperinflation and stuff like that, because they were um, sending all of the grain and stuff to the mainland to support the civil war. And um, the because of, yes. And then because of um, an incident resulting in taxed cigarettes and this woman getting, sh this woman who was selling said cigarettes getting shot by KMT soldiers, a rebellion broke out in February 28, 1947. So then Chiang Kai-shek sent the military to Taiwan to carry out repression on um, a massive scale. And thus really, truly marked the beginning of like the kind of um, the conflict between Ben Shengren and Wai Shengren. And because the KMT was all made up of all Wai Shengren, kind of Wai Shengren of all classes just became like um, just... They, they were um, seen as the oppressors, even though the KMT was pretty much only the elite of the um, of the Wai Shengren. So then, and, after the Huaihai campaign in the mainland China, which you know resulted in a communist victory, Chiang Kai Shek realized that the KMT was totally fucked. So then he appointed um, this dude named Chen Cheng as the chief executive of the Southeast and the chairman of Taiwan Taiwan's provincial government in preparation for Taiwan to become his base of operations for the so-called um, liberation of the mainland and. Um, on the mainland, under the guise of currency reforms, Chiang Kai-shek collected the savings of, you know, the middle classes. Like, you know, he took their gold, their silver, the U.S. dollars, all of which was worth approximately uh, 300 million U.S. dollars, and then sent all of that to Taiwan, which was then used to stabilize the new Taiwan dollar. So Taiwan's kind of economic stability after the Civil War was kind of the result of that. Partially. Yeah, I just like to interject with a personal story. Um, a lot of the discontent, uh, the, the the Taiwan, the Benson and pe uh, you know people in Taiwan had against uh, the KMT government is actually very similar to 
um, the you know the 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 same discontent felt by people on mainland China, you know, <laughs> leading up to the Chinese Civil War. You know, my um, my so my great uh, my grandpa, all right, uh, he he t- used to tell me the story that uh, you know the there was such a because you know after. Uh, after the Japanese uh, invasion slash occupation ended, everyone in China was expecting kind of return to normal life. But Chiang Kai-shek's regime decided to pursue the civil war against the communists instead. So a lot of resources getting basically consumed by this by this war, and uh, which led to hyperinflation. And and you know my my great uh, grandpa, my, not my great grandpa, my grandpa was telling me that it got so bad, you know, sometimes uh, they're just, the, the KMT government just printing tons of paper money. And and to, in the end, it, it, the, the paper money become kind of worthless, right? And then they, like, like they, like one of the things they did printing work, uh, paper money is, you know, they take like the real valuable stuff, like, like you say, like gold <laughs> and, and precious metal, they take them, they took with them to Taiwan. Yeah. And you know why my grandmother is so on my mom's side is so good at mental math is because um, when the KMT was issuing the new Taiwan currency um, as their as part of the currency reform program, she was a bank teller and she was responsible for that. So a lot of a lot of math involved in counting and a lot of overtime. Anyways, but the thing is, I like to mention, it was the same discontent, but in the mainland, it's like there's no feeling of, oh, th- these people are like, you know, are different from us. They're just different classes of mainlanders, you know, or different um, or just um, people representing different interests among mainland Chinese people. Whereas in Taiwan, it's like, OK, we've been colonized for 50 years by Japanese. And then so then there's going to be some cultural differences between Taiwanese people and mainland Chinese people. And then these mainlanders just come in and the ruling class like the Chiang Kai-shek, they carry out this stuff. It's kind of... um. Unfortunately, but it's just the way people work. It's you just associate this sort of stuff with like identity. Yes. So, anyways, June twenty fourth, nineteen forty nine, Chiang Kai Shek arrives in Taipei, and from then on, soldiers from the mainland migrated to Taiwan, totaling to approximately one one point two million. These soldiers never really planned on staying in Taiwan. Chiang Kai Shek told them that they would be going back to the mainland soon. So, you have a lot of people who just kind of got separated from their families and um yeah so but and this marked a great shift in taiwan's demographic composition because prior to this the majority of um even though the majority of taiwan's population was han chinese there was little to no han chinese with roots from beyond the coastal provinces of fujian and guangdong whereas these new migrants that came with the kmt were from all over mainland china and um, like I said before, there was a degree of de facto segregation between Ben Shengren and Wai Shengren because the soldiers, the 1.2 million soldiers who um, moved to Taiwan were given housing in these um, things called Zhenchun, which is like military dependent villages. So they had their own little seg- little villages that were all Wai Shengren and they kind of lived their life, you know, among themselves. And around this time, av- after February 28th of 1947, martial law was carried out and Ben Shengren were excluded from high levels of government. So then there was this sort of attitude of Wai Shengren being superior, while petty bourgeois Ben Shengren held classist attitudes towards many um, Wai Shengren, like we mentioned previously, because a lot of those Wai Sheng soldiers were, you know, were poor because they came from rural China and all over the place. And whereas Taiwan was experienced some development as a result of, um, of um, Japanese occupation. And because the new government was composed of Wai Shengren, and because of the February 28th incident, there were high levels of distrust and animosity between Ben Shengren and Wai Shengren. And not only this, while Ben Shengren saw Wai Shengren as oppressors, the KMT saw Ben Shengren as potential traitors due to having been educated as um, Japan's colonial subjects. So until 1990s, like we mentioned previously, um, the so-called National Assembly, the um, Legislative Yuan, exec- Etc. were all dominated by Wai Shengren, despite Wai Shengren being a minority in Taiwan's population. And not only this, but Wai Shengren were beneficiaries of affirmative action in civil servant examinations. Just imagine if um, white people in America were the beneficiaries of affirmative action. 
it's kind of like that, except um, white people are the majority in America, whereas white people are the minority. So in 1956, the acceptance rate for um, bin Sengren and civil for like civil service was 0.061 percent. And in the military in 1960, only 13.8 of the lieutenants, 9.5 percent of field officers and 1.3 percent of general officers were um, Taiwan born. And Taiwan born is not just um, bin Sengren, but also mainlanders like mainlanders like who's like you, you know descendants of mainlanders who were born in taiwan because even even though you were born in taiwan during that time you were still considered a white singer and it's like kind of kind of carries over now imagine with these sort of odds like you'd imagine a lot of them were probably white singer so clearly an era of white singer superiority and chiang kai-shek's legitimate legitimacy at the time largely rested on the policy of reclaiming the mainland, as well as his, you know, support from the U.S. because um, on the international stage. So um, many people felt that Ben Sengren were cannon fodder in the eyes of Chiang, since Ben Sengren were hardly seen as one of our own by the KMT. And reclaiming the mainland would be a victory for Wai Sengren that wouldn't necessarily benefit Ben Sengren, like, in their, like, in their minds. So, and then as the... As the mainland China continued to develop its industrial base and create and successfully create nukes and also replace the so-called ROC in the UN, it became even more obvious that the policy of reclaiming the mainland was nothing but just um, an unattainable dream. So without a realistic political goal, there was this sort of ideological vacuum in Taiwan. It's very important for this episode. And by this time, there was a sizable Bensheng petty bourgeois that was anti-KMT. But also, unlike the previous opponents to the KMT that were more left-leaning, these um, anti-KMT people were liberals. So another interesting shift in the political um, trajectory of Taiwan and the alignment that's, of political forces, I suppose. That's because uh, the, the pre previous generation of opposition to KMT that was more left-leaning was squashed pretty ruthlessly by the Chiang Kai-shek regime. Yeah. Including both Ben Sheng and Wai Sheng, and if you were a communist or even suspect suspected of being a communist, you were you you were thrown in jail for a long time, were killed. Chiang Kai Shek dies in 1975, and he was replaced by the vice leader, Yan Jia Gan, for the remainder of his term. As you know, for the remainder of his term, and then after Yan Jia Gan completed his term, the National Assembly elected um Jiang Jingguo, who was his son, as um as the new leader of Taiwan. And our previous episode, I believe, largely covered the Jiang Jingguo era. So we're just going to skim over that real quick. Jiang Jingguo era, heavy emphasis on economic development because um, previously it was more like, okay, we're going to reclaim the mainland and all that. So then there was a shift in attitude towards Ben Shengren and um, Jiang Jingguo really tried to get um, them more involved in politics at, a higher, at higher levels of government um, for a variety of reasons. One is just because he, he kind of knew the um, the sort of discontent towards the KMT among these provincial identity lines was brewing. And also because reclaiming the mainland became unrealistic and because he saw little to no hope of um, continuing the um, so-called Zhang dynasty because all of his kids were pretty, um, they were, they, they weren't, let's just say they weren't cut for, politics they were just underachievers and disappointments to him so then there during were this time your typical kind of like the fun trust fund babies right it's very spoiled and and i mean he it's not for lack of trying and jiang jingguo tried to groom his own son for succession but they're just not cut for it and you know you know how his sons were half belarusian so um uh, for I think at some point, one of his sons, who was being considered for politics, started dyeing his hair black and wearing um, dark contacts. No way. I, 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 I read somewhere just because um they were still like they were still like you know Chinese nationalists. So it would it, to them it thought it would be really weird if we had like some like Western looking dude, you know, be in higher levels of government. Uh. But then he eventually died of diabetes. Yeah. Two of his kids died of or two or three of his kids died of diabetes. Just kind of I think just. Bad genetic lottery. Yeah. Or, um, and then, so then, Zhang Jingguo era, 10 major construction projects. We covered that in the previous episode. Not going to really get to them. It's just, you know, just a lot of basic, like, 
infrastructure that's set up for, you know, Taiwan's further industrial development. And this coincided with the time when Japan was um, kind of moving up in the production chain. So then Taiwan doing Taiwan started doing more low level manufacturing for Japanese companies. And this kind of was the time when the economic miracle of Taiwan happened and it became one of the four um, Asian tigers among with uh, along with Hong Kong, Singapore and the bad part of Korea or South Korea. And um, Jiang Jingguo kind of his policy of bringing more Ben Shengren into higher levels of power was called um, Cui Tai Qing Zheng Ce. How would he translate that? It's kind of like promotion of the policy of the um, promotion of Taiwanese youth. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anyways, he brought the likes of Li Donghui, Wu, Wu Duanli, and Wu Boshong into the higher echelons of the KMT. And these were all, um, these are all major political figures in the KMT that we're going to see. But they were all Ben Shengren instead of Wai Shengren. Though Li Donghui is going to be our focus for today. Just keep that in mind. At the end of the day, although the so-called Republic of China was still a military dictatorship and martial law that was enacted in 1907 was still effect. Um, wait, I didn't word that sentence right. Basically, it was still a military dictatorship and there was still martial law. So despite all of these um, all of these policies of um, promoting Ben Shengren, there was still a lot of discontent and a lot of contradictions that were brewing. One of which was um, January 1st, 1979, when the U.S. and the PRC established formal ties. And um, like I said before, one of the major power sources of the KMT was its um, alliance with the U.S. So Jiang Jingguo was pretty much cut off from that. Um, so over the course of the 70s, petty bourgeois Bensheng intellectuals began calling for the redistribution of political power. And I'd like to note, I'd like to ask the listeners to note, how all of their demands are in the political arena, but not in the economic. So it's very typical of you know petty bourgeois led, middle class led uh, movements that aren't that shouldn't be called revolutions. It's basically they want a redistribu a redistribution of power within the um, existing bourgeois government. So they're reformists, not revolutionaries. So then they want things like democratization, localization, independence, and these things became common, like commonly discussed topics. And this marked the beginning of a great challenge to the KMT's authorities. Though the KMT effectively suppressed communists in the past, it didn't really have experience in dealing with petty bourgeois liberal opposition. So then, like we mentioned in the last episode, they started setting up all these um, pro, um, pro, not, not pro-independence, um, pro-democracy and anti-KMT magazines, and there was a cat and mouse game, cat and mouse chase between um, the magazines and the KMT. The KMT would ban them, and they would change the names and then set up shop again, and then repeat the rinse and repeat. This culminated in the Formosa Magazine incident, or, call, or Kaohsiung incident, because um, Formosa, one of the magazines was Formosa Magazine, or Meili Dao Zhajit, and it held a commemoration event on International Human Rights Day, and um, there was great... Um, police response. It was the greatest clash between civilians and the police since the February 28th massacre in 1947. And the organizers of the magazine were arrested and sentenced. And some of the, pe and the people who were arrested were um, Shi Mingde, Huang Xinjie, Lin Nixiong, Lu Xiulian, Chen Ju, Zhang Junhong, Yao Jiawen, Lin Hongxuan. And all except for Lin Hongxuan have been the DPP chairman at some point. So keep this in mind, Carl. Any of these names sound familiar? Oh, yeah. I mean, Li Xiulian for sure. <laughs> because yeah. What about Chen Ju? Uh, not so much. Chen Ju, uh, she's Minde, the mayor. Definitely. Yeah. Because he's, uh, he's like one of the godfather, right, of DPP. And, and for our audience who is not familiar with the acronym DPP, uh, DPP stands for Democratic Progressive Party, which is... Uh, uh, which emerged to be the main opposition uh, party in Taiwan in the later years. And, and currently, the, uh, they have took, taken power. The current Taiwanese leader, um, uh, Tsai Ing-wen, is from the DPP. So we, we will get to how they kind of transition themselves from uh, 
like a kind of underground uh, petty bourgeoisie opposition party to, you know, take in power. Yes. And um, the lawyers included, the, the lawyer in the um, Formosa magazine incident included Jiang Pengjian, Chen Shuibian, Xie Changting, Su Zhenchang. And all four of these people became notable politicians in the DPP. Jiang Pengjian was the first chairman of the DPP, and Chen Shuibian was elected leader of Taiwan in 2000. Xie Changting was the first DPP mayor of Kaohsiung, then the so-called premier of the um, you know, so-called Republic of China. Then he became the chairman of the DPP, and now he's um, Taiwan's representative to Japan. So he's kind of like the underground ambassador. And um, Su Zhenchang is the current so-called premier of the, um, you know, the ROC, the Taiwan authorities. And he's the former chairman of the DPP. So, you know, a few, a few more of these incidents happened around the time. This was the 80s. It became clear that the KMT could no longer hold on to power without some major changes. So people think of um, the democratization of Taiwan as this sort of revolution. But I don't think so. I, I, I see it as a reorganization of the bourgeois dictatorship. Is a recomposition of it so that it could maintain its class rule and maintain um, social stability. Because in lack, if there weren't like a socialist revolution during this time and things began to deteriorate, deteriorate, you would see a failed state. So furthermore, um, like we mentioned, I mean, before, basically the the people who were in the opposition at the time, they what they're demanding is not a fundamental restructuring of the society. What they are they are demanding is they themselves getting a, a share of the political power. Uh, they wanted the political power to be redistributed among the Benson and elite, right? Which is them, represented by these, uh, uh, you know, lawyers and professionals and, and, and who they see. They, they themselves represent Benson and interests, but really they just represent the Benson and the, 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 the professional class or the middle class interests, right? Yes. And then there were a few. So some of these incidents include like the, the one we mentioned before, the Jiangnan incident, which involved the murder of the author who wrote an unauthorized biography for Jiang Jingguo. He was a U.S. citizen and living in the U.S. when members of the Bamboo Union gang, Zhu Lianbang, killed him. Zhu Lianbang is like, trying, like one of Taiwan's biggest uh, mafias. And it's basically like one of the even. OK, fun fact, even Taiwan's like criminal underground is like divided between like provincial lines. They're like Bensheng gangs and Weisheng gangs. And the Zhu Lianbang yeah. would be the Weisheng gang. What do you gang. think? Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and it's also they, uh, you know, they have very close tie with the uh, KMT regime, right? I mean, like the, the, the Chiang Kai-shek has all, you know, f throughout his uh, rise to political power, Chiang Kai-shek always maintained very close tie to mob. <laughs> I mean, that, yeah. that came about in 1927 when he when he employed the Shanghai mob to massacre the communists and 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 then you know you know like they they use a kind of the the, the mob as their kind of spy network to 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 spy on the leftists i mean same the same trend basically continue in taiwan even under his uh, his son's uh, rule Anyways, the Jiangnan incident kind of soured the relationship between um, Jiang Jingguo and the U.S. because um, because Taiwan's intelligence was involved in killing a U.S. citizen. So Jiang Jingguo was forced to purge his intelligence team, which included one of his sons. So that ended um, his son's political career. And then more stuff that happened around that time that really um, that re really um, discredited the KMT was. 1985, there was the um, the Taipei 10th Credit Affair. So there was mismanagement and corruption of the 10th Credit Cooperative, which resulted in many people's savings disappearing overnight. There were um, over 100,000 victims and 60-some companies bankrupted. So the then finance minister, Lu Kang was forced to resign. And what, re whatever remaining trust there was in the KMT just kind of evaporated. I don't know if you've heard of this incident. This was kind of new to me when I was doing research because this was still before my time. I guess you were a little kid when this happened. Yeah, in 1985, I was still in elementary school. <laughs> so, no, I wasn't familiar with it. Yeah, but interesting note. Notice how it was a um, credit cooperative. So you're going to, this will kind of go into things because um, even though Taiwan's capitalist, it, it wasn't organized along like a, a orthodox capitalist society. 
there was still a lot of top-down control that's atypical to, for Westerners. Taiwan is not one of the, you know, kind of like the the, the Chicago boys uh, model of de- economic development. Uh, or Hong Kong. Once the economic development was was top-down, state-directed, and Jiang Jingguo, uh, who had been as the son of Jiang Kai-shek, was sent to study in Soviet Union in his youth. Um, you know, so after he came back uh, and became groomed for leadership under KMT, he basically adopted a lot of the kind of the state-directed economy model from former Soviet Union and then implement them in Taiwan. Uh, you know, like that. that's... That's not actually what uh, you know the what we've been taught at least in U.S. universities about how free market capitalism should work. <laughs> like uh, I, if Taiwan I, uh, were a free market capitalist society, it would be really poor right now. Yeah, I mean, I just a little anecdotal side note. Like in 1997, I was um, so I was I was junior in in caltech and i i was taking a economics class and i wanted to write a paper on kind of how the, the asian east asian um development model right which is just very obvious to me you know the example uh, of t- japan south korea taiwan that they, these are all like state directed uh, economies and and this in, in, to a similar extent with the model was being adopted by on mainland China itself. Uh, but my professor actually said no 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 you know the that that model is totally been discredited. Uh, you know because this was the time of uh, onset of the Asian financial crisis in 1997, and she's like no 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 you know like that the, the current crisis just proves the superiority of the free market capitalism. You know you you should really uh, choose a different topic, but I, that just kind of showed kind of the ideological <laughs> works that happen on the university, like at the university level in U.S. Right? I mean, this was 1997. Uh, you know, in hindsight, that was just a little hiccup. But anyway, go ahead. So, um, basically, oh, I was mentioning that because. Um, a lot of the liberalization that will happen that you'll see in the 1990s and the 2000s will be the liberaliza- total liberalization of Taiwanese society. And like this sort of like a lot of the government held um, these sort of credit cooperatives and state owned enterprises and stuff. You'll see a lot of them start getting privatized to varying extents, including education. So like you'll see also like the neoliberalization of higher higher education in Taiwan as well. I didn't do too much research in that topic, but. It happens. So it's if oh, you want to learn yeah. more about it. Yeah, let's let's uh, let's move quickly move through uh, the rest of the 80s so we can get there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So then 1986, Jiang Jingguo. At that point, Jiang Jingguo's legacy was the um, economy. But as you can see, politically, it was disaster after disaster. You have like all sorts of opposition. You had the KMT involved in all, all sorts of scandals, you know, killing a US, U.S. citizen and pissing the U.S. off, like fucking up a credit co- cooperative and bankrupting a lot of people so as a result the kmt decided to be more lenient towards its opposition and the dpp was formally established in 1986 before it was just a united front um called the Dangwai movement which was independence against the kmt that couldn't form a party because um of the ban to political parties other than the kmt anyways the tpp was still illegal but it, it it was established formally in 1986, nonetheless. So, as we mentioned, the Dangwai movement was originally part of a united front that was opposed to the KMT, but separatism became a package deal later on, you know, like one of those identity politics things. 1987, um, Jiang Jingguo ends martial law, thus ending 38 years of military dictatorship, and um. Uh, November 2nd, 1987, he allows those with family in the mainland to finally go visit family. And in 1988, January 1st, Jiang Jingguo ends the ban on independent newspapers and non-KMT parties. And then later that month, in less than two weeks, on January 13th, he dies. So, what's the significance of his death? Well, his death caused this, um, a schism in the KMT Along what lines, guess? Oh, identity lines, of course. Yep. 
本省人、外省人。蒋经国 didn't name a successor. And um, keep in mind that the leader back then was still elected by the unelected, um, so-called National Assembly. So then, um, the Wai Sheng elite and the party thought that the party state was rightfully theirs, but the vice leader at that time was Li Donghui, who was a um, Ben Sheng elite. So enter this dude named Song Chuyu. Song Chuyu. Became be, began his career as Jiang Jingguo's secretary. Then he became director general of the information office. So his he was like the, the censorship dude. And then he was in contact with the opposition and realized that the KMT's old ways were unsustainable. And thus he fought against the conservatives in the KMT who wished to block Li's ascendancy. By the way, Song Chuyu was a Wai Sheng Ren who was born in the mainland. Whereas, thus ultra conservatives in the KMT quit and then formed a new party called the New Party. In 1993, Xin Dang, and thus、um, Song Chuyu temporarily gained the support of Li Donghui and was appointed the chairman of the Taiwan provincial government. Note: back then there was still a provincial government that was separate from the so-called national government.、Um, you know, to maintain the、um, to to maintain the facade, there is a so-called Republic of China beyond Taiwan, Jinmen and Mazu and Jinmen and Mazu Penghu. But then the provincial government has since then been frozen, with its duties transferred to the、um, the central government. So, 1994, chairman of Taiwan province became a position that was directly elected by the people, and Song Chuyu began、um, became the first chairman that was directly elected by the people of Taiwan with an approval rating of around 90 percent. Keep this in mind: 90 percent approval rating, Wai Sheng Ren, KMT elite, whereas Li Donghui, you know, the dude who was the actual leader, but then he was. But then in 1996, there was to be Taiwan's first、um, direct election of its leader. Now Li Donghui recognized that Song Chuyu had aspirations of his own, so Li revised the constitution and froze the、um, so-called provincial government, thus stripping Song Chuyu, who was the、um, the head of the provincial government, of power. And then Li Donghui chose Lian Zhan as his running mate. The DPP's candidate was Peng Mingmin, who we mentioned in the episode in one of the previous episodes was one of the authors of the Manifesto of the Taiwanese People's Self Salvation. But he lost to Li. Li Donghui was pretty popular, and then Li Donghui kicked Song Chuyu out of the party, and then began openly expressing his um two state theory. You covered the two two state theory real quick. Yes.、Yeah, so the two state. Th- so before um the official stance of Taiwan. I mean, it still is the official written stance, but it's not actively pursued anymore. Before it was,、um, there was only one China, and one China is the Republic of China. The two-state theory is mainland China is the People's Republic of China, and Taiwan,、um, Penghu, Jinmen, Mazu are the Republic of China. Or there's one China and one Taiwan, depending on how you interpret it. But back then,、um, it, it was just,、um, it was basically a shift from saying that. The ROC is the Chinese government that's temporarily based in Taiwan. Too, the ROC government is the Taiwanese government. Right. So basically, this is a recognition that、uh, that the political fiction of Republic of Ta- China、uh, has control over、uh, all of China, Taiwan, and Mongolia is a is a lie, and and recognition of the kind of the uh, 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 the facts on the ground, but but at the same time wants to. Um, uh, it's also an effort to gain recognition for the the, the current Taiwan's current status to,、uh, to as to an grant, independent country. Yes, to grant it legitimacy and basically keeps the status quo and then and then、uh, you know that 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 close the、it's、door. Formalization of the status quo. Exactly. Exactly. That's that's a better way to put it. So、yes. this is um, it's really strange because I think a lot of Westerners get confused. They're like, oh, Taiwan's reactionary because they claim to be um all of the government of all of China. But actually, that was the point of unity between um Jiang Jie, Chiang Kai Shek, and Mao Zedong, because both of their view was okay. There's one China, and our respective governments are competing entities for that one China, and that this is something for us to take care, like to deal with as Chinese people. It's not something that foreigners have a right to um. Interfere with. You're gonna start seeing a shift in that because Li Donghui. We're gonna start getting into Li Donghui in this episode. Yeah, I think this is a、yes. good、um, segue, right? Yes. Yes. So Li Donghui, I, I like to call him the Judas among Judases, and you're gonna find out why. 
He was born in Taiwan during Japanese colonization. He was also a Huangmin or Komin, which was um, during Japanese colonization. There was this policy towards the end where if you adapted Japanese customs and spoke Japanese at home and practiced Japanese religion and all that, all that stuff, you could formally become a like a formal subject of the emperor, which was like a higher status than like a regular um, colonized Taiwanese, but you're still not quite like real Japanese. And like that sort of ceremony involved um, didn't like denounce renouncing your Chinese ancestors and then getting new fake Japanese ancestors. It was kind of crazy. Anyways, Li Donghui was one came from one of those families and his Japanese name was Iwasato Masao or Yan Li Zhengnan in Chinese. And um, in 1946, he joins the Chinese Communist Party as a student at National Taiwan University through a front group called, what is it called? Taiwan, Taiwan, Min, Taiwan Min Zhu Zhi Zhi Tong Meng. So the, I just um, want to interject for a second. Uh, Li Denghui's brother, his older brother, was actually, uh, actually joined the Japanese uh, Imperial Army. I, I'm not clear whether he was drafted or he volunteered. But he died, and he was actually enshrined in the famous, uh, or, or I should say, infamous uh, uh, Yasukuni Shrine in Japan, which were war criminals also enshrined. And 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 Li Denghui makes a big deal to go worship there every time he visits Japan, and which you know, of course, just another another of his famous trolling um, stunt. But Li Denghui, if you're listening to this, you should seppuku yourself. <laughs> Anyways, um, so he so he joins the um the Chinese Communist Party in 1946 through a front group called the um I think I'm trying to translate it. It's like the um how would you translate Taiwan Zhi Zhi Tong Meng? It's the the union I, I, the union uh, for the self determination for Taiwan's self determination and democracy. Uh, close enough. Uh, Taiwan yeah. Democratic, uh, uh, d- d- Taiwan Democratic Autonomy, or Taiwan Democratic uh, Self uh, Self Determination Union. Oh, yeah, close enough. Something like that, which was headed by um Xie Shuehong, who later moved to Beijing. She was um she's a Taiwanese communist, and this was under the directive of the Central Committee of the Chinese Communist Party, a um peripheral. I don't know. This this union was created by Xie Xuehong under the directive of the Central Committee of the Chinese Communist Party, and it was a peripheral organ organization of the CCP's Working Committee of Taiwan Province. And yes. this working committee was headed by um, Tsai Xiaoqian. Yes, a um, lot of people don't realize, like Tai, you know, Taiwan had its own indigenous uh, Communist Party. Uh, this was during the you know, Japanese occupation period, which we have talked about in our previous episode. And, and this, um, uh, and this, of course, because of the cultural ties and, and, and this, the Taiwanese Communist Party work in very close association with the, the, uh, the, 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 the Communist Party of China. And they, they actually send their members to join, um, you know, join the, the Communist Party on the mainland, and one of their member was uh, Tsai Xiaoqian, who joined, who participated in the famous Long March. So he was sent back to Taiwan to kind of head, head the, you know, Taiwan underground resistance work to prepare for, you know, the liberation of Taiwan in 1940s. But that that kind of fell apart because uh, because of the the, the Chiang Kai Shek's, yeah, Chiang Kai Shek's white terror. Yes. Yeah. Li Denghui quit the Communist Party in 1947, and um, he and Tsai Xiaoqian promised each other to keep his involvement in the party a secret. And then later, he claims that he never sold out the communists to Taiwan, communists in Taiwan. But um, the KMT has a very comprehensive intelligence network, and for him to have gotten to such a high level in the KMT would have meant that Jiang Jingguo looked through his files carefully. And it was also mentioned that Li explained to him how he joined and quit the party. So are we really going to believe that he could have earned Jiang Jingwu's trust without selling the communists out? I don't, I don't, I for one don't really believe it. And um, because the law back then was that once someone has participated in a communist organization, he's presumed to still be an active member unless proven otherwise. You have to, you have to voluntarily surrender to the KMT. And from declassified documents, we can see that um, 
Those involved in his group were executed or imprisoned, and the case was named after a member he had introduced to the organization. So how is it that someone he introduced was executed, yet he was able to worm his way into the KMT? I think a snitch is a snitch is a snitch. Interesting and fun fact, if you want to look for the proof of this, you can go to um, the... Um, this, the Taiwan's um, Department of Security, um, and look through one of the files. Um, what is it? <laughs> the second, second and the title of it is Taiwan and Li Donghui is actually named in that file as Jian Fei Li Donghui. <laughs> Actor. Or like, or like <laughs> communist bandit Li Donghui. Well, Jian Fei, you know, in, this particular, just, in particular case, it, it just uh, literal translation is just, just a traitor, tra tra traitorous um, bandit Li Donghui, which I say is a, it's yep, an accurate yep. description. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, enough of that. He studies abroad in the 1950s and receives his master's in agricultural economics at Iowa State University. And then in 1957, he returned to Taiwan and worked as an economist at the Sino-American Joint Commission on Rural Reconstruction, or the um, Zhongguo Nongchun Fuxing Lianhe Weiyuanhui, or Nongfuhui for short. And notice how they used the they use um, Sino instead of like Taiwan back then. Anyways, it was a commission established in mainland China in 1948 that moved to Taiwan in 1949. And as the name implied, it was sponsored by the U.S. And then um, later in the 1960s, he went back to the U.S. and did his Ph.D. at Cornell. And then he worked at, as an adjunct professor at um, National Taiwan University's economics department. And in the 1970s, when Chiang Jingguo was the so-called premier of the ROC, Li Donghui became the youngest member of Chiang Jingguo's cabinet. And like I said before, Chiang Jingguo was trying to get more Ben Xiong involved in higher levels of government, and Li Donghui was one of them. He somehow became the, the vice leader in 1984. And... When Jiang Jingguo died, um, Li Donghui became the leader with the help of Song Chuyu. So economically, Li Donghui was very pro-US, um, very pro-Japan, and pro-Bad um, Korea, South Korea. And he really wanted to limit Taiwanese business activities in mainland China. Keep in mind that um, you know, in the 1980s, there was finally some sort of so certain levels of opening up between um, Taiwan and the mainland under Jiang Jingguo and Deng Xiaoping. Back then, um, limiting Taiwanese business activities in mainland China could be done under the guise of being, um, you know, anti-communist or whatever. Because for the longest time, when Li Donghui first came to power, he wasn't, he didn't make public his um, separatist views. If you listen to his um, inauguration speeches from earlier on, he'll talk about how it is the aspiration of all Chinese people on both sides of the Taiwan Strait to reunify to peacefully reunify the um, the motherland and all that stuff. That that was actually the standard for the KMTs. I, I think a lot of Western Westerners listening might not understand that. They think that, oh, Chiang Kai-shek, oh, origin story of Taiwan, Chiang Kai-shek and the separatists are all the same. Oh, well, you see, Chiang Kai-shek did pave the way for that to happen, but not quite. That sort of, it's kind of an oversimplification to think that. Anyways, under Li Donghui's leadership, there's a sort of slow but very obvious ideological shift in Taiwanese society. Because until then, people spent much of their time in history class learning about mainland Chinese stuff. Like, my mom had to remember shit like, um, which provinces does a Yangtze River run through? Or um, which mountain in which province has this or that? And how high is this mountain? And which what's the largest um, freshwater reserve in China? And stuff like that. Stuff that you can Google nowadays, but you had to memorize back then. Yeah, um, interesting fact. So right now, very recent, the the song by originally by Taiwanese singer. Uh, the song you you know the song. Uh, 
more commonly known as what Xue Hua Piao Piao, Fei Feng Xiao Xiao, right? The song Yi Jian Mei that 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 become viral because uh, a, a man with egg shaped head in China sing the song and then the, the the video went viral and the song itself went viral and uh, and and then I see a lot of uh, comments both on Twitter and YouTube by people from Taiwan saying, oh well well you know it's it's not a it's not a Chinese song. It's a it's a it's a Taiwanese song. It's sing by a by a Taiwanese singer Fei Yuqing. Um, but uh, Fei Yuqing. Yeah, yeah. Fei, Fei, like, Xiao Fei, the Fei. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fei Yuqing. And then um, I remember because but this song was actually originally uh, the theme song of 1984 Taiwan drama of the same name Yi Jianmei, which which would happen to be the first. Taiwan drama was that, that was allowed to circulate on the mainland, you know. So, so I actually remember that TV series. You no, know, Fei Yuqing. It's funny because Fei Yuqing is one of those who would identify as Chinese first, exactly, and not Taiwanese. Like until like maybe the '90s, like nobody in Taiwan would have considered him a Taiwanese because he was Wai Sheng Ren. Exactly, exactly. I mean, th- th- that's why I'm I I just thought so laughable because the song. It's a theme. First of all, it, it became popularized as a theme song of the same TV name TV drama Yi Jianmei, which is set in 1930s mainland China, right? And and like the the song itself is it's very like I mean it's it kind of it's a kind of very evocative of the the like the the traditional Chinese tune and like kind of the Chinese style. And and Fei Yuqin is the one who. Who who also like he was famous for singing like uh, my Chinese heart right what is Hong Guoxin on mainland and 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 then people are saying oh yeah but but he's he was a singer he you know that he just have to make make money to appeal to mainland audience but th- that's this not song the case was... no it was his, his, his that was his like he's your very typical like Wai Sheng who was brought up under the KMT when like Xiang Jiechi and Jiang Jingwu were still alive. Exactly. Exactly. Like in 1980s, when the song came in out, in 1980s, he wouldn't have called himself a Taiwanese. Exactly. In 1980s and even in 1990s, most people in Taiwan still identify as Chinese. You know, and 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 like they they no like nobody would even make it an issue if we say, oh, that that's a Chinese song, right? And but yeah, now yeah. we have stupid. Uh, Kids on the internet and say, "Oh no, no, no! That's not a Chinese song. That's a that's a Taiwanese song, sing by a Taiwanese singer." Which is kind of a historical because that that just when the song came out, it's it's kind of totally funny. You have um, China. it's kind of like you have some people in Taiwan, like some younger people who like travel to Xiamen, and they're like, "Wait, why do people here speak Taiwanese?" <laughs> yeah, the, so for people who not familiar with the geography of Taiwan Strait. Xiamen is directly across the water uh, uh, from Taiwan. And, and Xiamen is one of the main ports from where kind of the ancestor of the, the Benson then who traveled to Taiwan from, right? Because Xiamen was, uh, was a main base for uh, uh, Koxinga or, or Zhen Chenggong, right? Zhen Chenggong and his fleet. So Zhen Chenggong actually led his men sail from Xiamen to uh, you know, take over Taiwan from the Dutch colonialist. Uh, you know, four hundred years ago. So, so like, <laughs> I mean, it's it's sometimes it's quite astounding how it's kind of like uh, Americans going to the going to Britain and being like, hey, why do they speak American? <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, I think that's a good analogy because you know there are actually Americans are like that. So, so like, it, but still, it kind of boggles my mind. Like, given the close proximity of of you know Hong Kong and 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 uh, Taiwan and some 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 the, the profound ignorance <laughs> of some youth from from both places about mainland China is sometimes just comical. Actually, this one this one Taiwanese person once asked me. It's kind of weird because that person was born and raised in Taiwan, and I was born and raised in the U.S. But she was like, "Wait, so." The Taiwanese, which is what they call um, the Taiwanese variant of Hokkien, which is a southern Minan dialect, like mainland Chinese, the southern Chinese dialect from southern Fujian province that came to Taiwan from there. But then anyway, she was like, so is Taiwanese like a language that got developed out of Japanese when the Japanese um, colonized us? And I'm just like, Jesus fucking Christ, what did they teach you guys at school nowadays? 
<laughs> oh, I mean, I, I, yeah, people, people. I guess it's not limited to 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 Taiwan, right? I mean, where yeah, some US... kids who just don't really pay attention at school. Yeah. Right? you can't really blame individuals. Yeah. I don't think that's an accurate reflection of most people. Yeah, yeah. Anyways. Yeah, yeah. One of Li Donghui's um, first victories on the international stage was 1995, when the U.S. government and Congress allows him to visit the U.S. on an unofficial trip, like as an individual, not like as the leader of a country. Making Li Donghui the first incumbent Taiwan leader to visit the U.S. So this greatly boosted his popularity in Taiwan. And uh, he gives a speech at Cornell, where he studied, and he makes his view that the ROC is on Taiwan public. So now, um, though the Changs certainly did set the stage for separatism, they were vehemently against independence. So there's no such, there, under Chang, Chiang Kai-shek and Jiang Jingwo, there's no um, sort of, oh, the ROC is on Taiwan. No, it was, the ROC is China. Taiwan is just the part that we have control over, and it's the base for the recapture of the mainland. Even though eventually that just kind of everyone knew that that was bullshit, but that was the re that was the official rhetoric. Now, what Li Donghui is trying to say is, okay, the ROC is on Taiwan, which is factually correct, but you, you can kind of see how he's strate strategically using the so-called ROC as a veil for separatism. It's, he's not just going to say, oh, Taiwan is an independent country, but no, the ROC is an independent country that's on Taiwan. See, that's sort of, that way he can kind of, there's plausible deniability. So then rather than, you know, pursue formal independence, because in the past you had the hardliners who were like, you know, super anti-KMT and anti-ROC who wanted like whose idea of independence is to replace the so-called Republic of China with a um, Republic of Taiwan. Whereas the, um, you know, the more mainstream separatist bourgeoisie will use the Republic of China as a Chinese cover for their Taiwan independence. And then around this time, it was the three no's were um, popularized, you know, no reunification, no independence, and no use of military force. And this was basically the same, what the situation was by the time um, Jiang Jingguo came to power, though, you know, when Jiang Jingguo was still the leader, the official rhetoric was still the, like the pursuit of reunification. So Li Donghui's whole speech was basically a public announcement on the international stage that the Taiwan authorities are now seeking to maintain the status quo indefinitely. So I to give a little um, like historical background of 90s, at this time I was already in college in U.S. Um, like this, you know, like there was a, so the Soviet Union collapsed in 1992, right? And then there was an expectation at the time, uh, globally, in fact, that China would follow the suit, especially after 1989 Tiananmen Square protest. I mean, there has been Western sanctions on China. So many people expect, you know, China would follow the suit of USSR and collapse. And that's when Li Denghui actually proposed um, uh, his, uh, his theory that China should be split into seven parts, right? His famous <laughs> speech on, on how China should be split into seven equal parts. Um, and, and, uh, and, 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 and at the same time, the, the end of the Cold War, um, which, which kind of the, you know, like the relief, the pressure on the U.S. to continue to pop up a military dictatorship in, in place like Taiwan and, and South Korea, which kind of, um, you know, led to transition in the, the so-called democratic transition in those places. Um, so like that, that also provided the additional uh, air of legitimacy, right? I mean, the, in, in South Korea, that uh, the military dictatorship ended, uh, you know, led to the first popular election. And then Li Denghui, the yes, but Li Denghui was very, uh, I think he's, whatever you say about him, he's a very, uh, a, a, a very tactical politician, right? He read, he was, he was able to read the, 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 the which way the wind was blowing. And so he, that led to the, the democratic election on Taiwan, which I think you are going to talk about next, right? Yes. 
Okay. And um, I want to mention, you know, you were talking about the 80s and the demo um, democratization of uh, democratization of um, South Korea and Taiwan. Mm -hmm. Notice what was happening at the same time in the socialist bloc. Perestroika, mm -hmm. Glasnost, yes. and all of, and like like the Berlin Wall falling. Yes. Yes. So then there was a sort of um, this sort of lent a legitimacy because rather than seeing that as a counter revolution and like because I th I think um. There are different things. One of them is the destruction of socialism, while the, what was happening in Taiwan was like a restructuring of the bourgeois dictatorship. Correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. But yeah. the way that it's presented then in Taiwan and the rest of the world is this is a worldwide, um, this is like a global phenomenon of um, democratic uprisings against authoritarianism. Right. I mean, like U.S. Me that's a U.S. narrative, right? Which pretty much it got adopted in most of the Western media. And that's like the religion that's practiced in Taiwan today, which is why you have people that might starting to begin being be like against capitalism, but they're still really anti like anti communist. So you have like new political parties that are forming that are like that use some leftist leftist rhetoric. But at the very end, you look at um their programs and all that stuff. It's basically like Maiden, play like like color revolution stuff. Yeah, I think one of the uh, one of the more successful strategy that the CIA and other Western intelligence have adopted since the end of the Cold War is they um, they have uh, you know first is uh, you know use of NGO and also adoption of a lot of the leftist rhetorics during the Cold War. You know, but a lot of do it the in a way that makes the so-called the new pseudo left. Very, very useless for the working class and harmless towards the bourgeoisie. Yes, yes, and and the, you know you, they they talk the right talks. You know, they invoke a lot of the same anti-colonial uh, uh, anti-colonial rhetorics that was developed out of the uh, anti-colonial struggle of 1960 and 70s. But so now they're doing they that in Taiwan. Now they're calling the KMT like colonial rule, and now they're 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 trying to um. Pack, they're they're trying to present um Taiwan independence as decolonization, even though it's like it's um led predominantly by um like the Han in Taiwan and not yeah, like I mean, the indigenous people. It's, it's hilarious. Same, same, I mean, same thing is happening in Hong Kong, right? You have the Lao San Collective uh, that that supposedly present a leftist uh, 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 view on on the Hong Kong protest movement and. And uh, you, if you look at their rhetorics, you know they they call themselves you know they're from a decolonial perspective. But what they really proposing, you know, it's it's not that very different. Like their agenda ha just happened to coincide perfectly with you know the U.S. State Department, Pompeo, and and all the right wing U.S. politicians like Marco Rubio, <laughs> right? And and but yeah. but. They have a very nice sound, all these nice sounding, you know, leftist rhetoric, which they adopted. Uh, but but uh, it, un underneath all that, if, if you look at the consequence, like Confucius says, right, you know, not only you should listen to the words, but you, you, you should also watch their actions. <laughs> it's hilarious that's, because in yeah. Taiwan, every every now and then you have these NGOs, like these like old white dudes going in and saying, oh, the democracy here is like falling apart and we need to do this and this and this to be more democratic. And they're just really pushing U.S. State Department stuff. And then people buy it up all the time. And it's like, dude, grow some common sense. Like in the U.S., like, you know, in impoverished black areas, if these like rich white dudes dressed in suits went in and told them like how to run how to run their communities, <laughs> they would they would be very doubtful. They would not listen to what those men in suits are saying not, not nothing against suits, but you, you know what I'm trying to say. He's like, I actually I had uh, I, I, in my mind I just uh, have a, a a picture of these uh, Mormon missionaries <laughs> going to going to the South Side Chicago uh, trying to preach. That that's that's my mental mental image. But okay, go basically, ahead. and then like uh, yeah, this um this this one um person I met in Taiwan, just kind of. I think stop talking to me over stuff like this. I was just like, I, I was like, you really think, I was like, you really think these people have your interests at heart? Like, who cares what these foreigners are saying about our democracy? Isn't, isn't what's important, like what we say about our democracy and how we can make it better for us? 
Um, I think, you know, there's still a factor of kind of white worship in most, much of East Asia. Kind of, kind of the oh, there result, definitely is. Yeah, there's a, like that leftover of the, the colonial uh, memory and the colonial history of the region, right? I mean, the, the still, that's why a lot of the, there's still a lot of uh, uh, importance <laughs> attached to, to all these white expats and what they have to say. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah. She yeah. called me um a um a she she called me dictatorial because I I was like you know I spoke about um U.S. aggression in the DPRK and she was like well that's that's protecting democracy and this and that and it's like that's not communism that's just authoritarianism so then I I, I pressed I pressed her on and then like I asked her like more. I just kept pressing on and I kept asking more questions about, okay, so what do you know about this? What do you know about like the Supreme People's on um, this Supreme People's Assembly? What do you know about the, this, that, and the other? And then she was like, To be honest, I haven't <laughs> investigated. And I'm just like, Well, that's a lot of talk for someone who hasn't investigated, is it? Isn't yeah, it? Yeah. yeah, she gave me this little like figurine to go take pictures of when I was in North Korea. Uh -huh. I never gave that figurine back over these arguments <laughs> anyways, <laughs> anyways back to the topic 1996 we mentioned that um we, we mentioned how um there was this dude named song Chu Yu who was um becoming really popular among taiwanese uh, across provincial lines both ben sheng and wai sheng ren and he posed a threat to li denghui's power in 1996 so li denghui picks lian zhan as his running mate, he freezes the um, provincial government to strip Song Chu Yu, who was chairman of the Taiwan provincial government, of his political power. And then around this time, there was also the Taiwan Strait Crisis. You want to get into the Taiwan Strait Crisis? Yes, uh, I I was so, so I was much more aware of the situation in 1996. I was uh, I was in college at the time, you know. So I I, I watch all the read all the <laughs> op eds in LA Times, um, etc. So to coincide it with the Taiwan election, you know, mainland China PRC uh, stage a, a, um, a missile test. Uh, basically, uh, in in Taiwan Strait, and and you know it, that was a big you know like that was a big point talking point at the time about you know how the big bad China is bullying the the plucky small democratic Taiwan. Uh, that that was a talking point in U.S. at the time. But but go ahead. So this kind of backfires because um, Taiwan's media presents it like like you said as like you know big bad China like oppressing small innocent Taiwan. So Li Denghui wins the re-election easily. And then um, we're going to get into his final term as um, leader from 1996 to um, 1996 to 2000. So I'm just going to look through my notes. I have it in another section. Yeah, while you're looking through your notes, uh, I can tell an anecdotal story of... Um... My college days, so some of my college classmates commented on the, the 1996 Chinese missile uh, test uh, in Taiwan Strait. They say, oh, yeah, you know, what? Uh, the, the, there's nothing to really nothing to worry about because, you know, the, the, the Chinese, uh, the, 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 the current um, level of Chinese uh, missile technology probably means they will miss their mark wide wi widely right and, and i'm just listening to that i'm like actually if you really think that that chinese missiles would miss or mark widely that that's actually a, a, a area of concern because then you don't know where they're gonna end up uh but anyway go ahead so basically um the last four years of Li the in the kmt what he was trying to do was just totally fracture the kmt because that would that way it would pave um it will pave a path towards victory for the opposition. So yeah. like we mentioned before, you know, you had people, you had um, the second generation of um, these Waisheng elite who um, formed the new party. That was literally just called the new party. And then yeah. people like Song Chu Yu formed the Qin Min Dang, or the People First Party. Yes. yes. So then I this mean, creates the, a fracture. It, because, it's also um, interesting that, that you brought 
you 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 brought to light that there's really also a, a clash of personality, right? So between the Song Chuyu and uh, Li Denghui, which further split the KMT ruling elite because you know Song Chuyu, he was a very popular politician and he had his own political aspirations, and Li Denghui being a very smart tactical politician, he. He maneuvered such a way to, you know, push Song Chuyu basically out of uh, out of limelight, and that's that led to Song Chuyu to form his own part political party, further dividing the K KMT, which led to eventually led to the first DPP victory, right? Yes, that happened in um, 2000. Um, so I've, Li Donghui kicks Song Chuyu out of the party, what? starts getting into his two-state theory. Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, I just want to interrupt. When did the desinification campaign in education start in Taiwan? Did that start under Li Donghui in 1990s, or did that start? It kicked off under Chen Shui Bian. Okay, okay. Like it kind of started happening under Li Donghui, but not like so out in the open. I think um I think we uh, talked about I think maybe now this episode is a good time to recap on it or this or the next episode like when we talk about the desinification of um the education because I do have some stuff about like the the laws that were passed that changed the um education system that that changed what was taught in history classes. Okay. Um, like back then um like national history in Taiwan referred to like all of Chinese history. Yes. And um as a little bit I, I think there were I I admit that it was a little bit. I'm not saying that it's too mainland focused, but it didn't have enough stuff about Taiwan, which mm -hmm. I, I think no matter what province you're in, you should know more about your own. You shouldn't. You should know more about your own province than what they were teaching at the time. Sure. Yeah. Sure. That's but then fair. they just yeah. But then now what they're doing is they're trying to totally get rid of learning that sort of stuff from the curriculum, which to be fair, it makes tests a lot easier because. You have like a few thousand years less to learn. Yes, <laughs> but um. Anyways, two thousand. Like we said, there was a party split. Lian Zhan was the incumbent vice leader, but Song Chuyu also runs. Now you see the problem. Song Chuyu was very popular. Lian Zhan was incumbent, and both were. Lian Zhan was still the KMT, but Song Chuyu was the KMT. This effectively splits the KMT vote. Yes, the blue camp. And uh, also towards the, the end of his term, Li Donghui also tells these German reporters that cross-strait relations are relations between two countries, and at the very least, there are special relations between two countries. So, um, yeah, I mean, and since Song Chui's popularity was like happened to be across pr the provincial divide, like among Ben Sheng and Wai Sheng Ren, that statement. I'm not just saying that to drop random trivia. It, it's meant to put Song Chui in a difficult position because if Song Chui supports it he'll alienate a good chunk of his supporters but if he's against it he'll also piss off yep. a significant chunk of his supporters this is why uh you know like a taiwan's democratization underway the identity politics start to play larger and larger role and the the and then opposition party democratic progressive party dpp will capitalize on that and and really Use the divide and conquer strategy to, to um to capture electorate, turrets, right? Yes. So um, Song Chuyu and Chen Shui-bian were both more popular than Lian Zhan, but because Lian Zhan and Song Chuyu were divided, um, divided the blue camp, Chen Shui-bian was able to win with guess the percentage of the votes he got. Uh. I I remember it was in the 30s, right? It's like yes, 39.3 percent. Yeah, just barely. Is, he just he's just barely squeezed in with a plural, not even a majority, but just 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 because he got the most votes because the the KMT votes were divided be, between Song Chuyu and Yan Zhang. Song Chuyu had 36.84 percent. Yeah, Lian Zhan had 23.1 percent. Yeah, because Lian Zhan really represent kind of like the ossified conservative KMT position that was kind of being phased out of popularity. 
Yeah. And, and Lian Zhang himself was not very, you know, like, was kind of not very charming. He has, no charisma. he has no charisma. <laughs> yes, yes. There was, um, the, the popular consensus in Taiwan at the time was, wow, the DPP is really good at, elect, like, really good at campaigning because they made, they made things out, like, their events were just, just, like, huge festivities, you know, with, like, fireworks and performances and just, there was a lot of pop and circumstance. Whereas, I think the DPP, I think the problem with the KMT is it's always been very um, complacent with itself. Yeah. That's still a problem with the KMT today. Well, I think it, it, it's come from like its history of being this uh, so used to one party rule for so long. <laughs> That's you kind of you kind of it's hard for you to kind of catch up with the times. Whereas the opposition can afford to be more experimental and and you know like just trying to try trying anything that will work, right? I mean, they're, they're probably quicker to adopt more popular tactics. I, I, that actually reminds me, like in in. Uh, post-Soviet Union after the collapse of USSR, um, <laughs> that U.S. actually sent in a lot of election consultants, quote unquote, to Yeltsin, you know, like because Yeltsin had such a flagging, uh, like after his first term, he, he was really deeply unpopular. So so U.S. were worried about his election chances. So they send in all these consultants, you know, doing those things like you talk about, like holding con pop concerts, you know, getting him out there dancing with with uh, like uh with with uh, with popular artists, you know, in open air concert, and you and and also U.S. on top of that, of course, pouring a lot of money to support these uh, Yeltsin's election campaign. So eventually, got Yeltsin to squeak by with a with a margin of victory. I mean, it's Just, the people who who um the the people who convince us to drink Coca Cola are the same people were the same people who were convincing Russians to vote for Yeltsin. Yes, basically. Yes, marketing. So, marketing. Yeah. So DPP, you know, this marks the first time the DPP um, became the incumbent party. I mean, the DPP had won local elections before. Like, for example, the, they, like Chen Shui-bian was the mayor of Taipei. And that's quite significant because um, cities like Taipei and um, Kaohsiung, they aren't, they're treated in Taiwan as like provincial level cities. So then in the past, under martial law, their mayors weren't elected by the city's residents, but they were appointed by the so-called National Assembly. So that it's like they're, they're pretty powerful positions, and especially Taipei, because like the capital is in Taipei. So if you win mayor of Taipei, you know, you're, you're kind of up there with, the, um, with all the big timers. So when the DPP was, we're going to recap, go back a little bit. When the DPP was created, it wasn't necessarily a separatist party, but just anti-KMT. But without the identity politics and stuff, like how do you set yourself apart from the KMT? Basically, whatever the KMT stood for, the DPP opposed. The KMT was for Chinese national identity. The DPP was against it. The KMT was against um, environmentalism, you know, for the sake of the economy. So the DPP supported environmentalism. The KMT was for um, nuclear power. So the DPP was against nuclear power. And in 1991, the um, DPP formalizes its um, pro-independence party platform, which marks the beginning of its strategy to win votes through identity politics. So it, the identity politics basically works like this. The KMT is made up of Weishengren. Weishengren are mainlanders. Mainlanders are Chinese. So therefore, to be against the KMT is to be against China. So therefore, we need to gain independence if we truly love Taiwan. It's it's basically the forefather of Tumblr political correctness. I mean, in a way, a lot of the you know, it's, this is a lot of KMT's own doing, right? From yes. from, from the years of KMT misrule and also um, from years of Cold War propaganda against mainland China, right? I mean, like like. Yes. It was a, DPP just very cleverly kind of transformed that that rhetoric from uh, before it was about this evil bad mainland uh, like the red Chinese right the the, the Chinese communists but like the the the, the mainland China but eventually kind of the the mainland China itself not just the, the say the communist government but China but the whole of mainland China became vilified right in in through this Cold War propaganda it became very easy for DPP just to 
draw this line so that is a bad china we're not part of that we don't want to be part of that <laughs> china is bad we are good right basically that that's that's what it comes down to yes so i i, I don't think um see supporters of the dpp think that they're like the antithesis of the kmt and i think that's a bad analysis i i see them as in a way they're a con- they're a continuation of it but they're also a split from it they continue the bourgeois rule. It's a continuation of anti-communism. It's a continuation of just the status quo, basically. But it's also a split in terms of things like national identity and stuff like that. Identity politics. Yes, that's that's one. Of the, yes, yes. That's I mean that's basically the major introduction in Taiwan politics. I see. I mean, like after the like the democratization is the, the, the basically the identity politics become very central platform for DPP yes. because, so because it's the like, fact um, that, that I hate they, Chiang Kai-shek but somehow everything he said about communists was correct yes exactly. and there's also this, this phenomenon of we hate Chiang Kai-shek but we still love America yep so to them it's like it's like um Chiang Kai-shek being an ally of the U.S. was just an unfortunate necessity or some sort of error or that yeah the u.s did support a bloody dictator but it's still good there's a certain level of cognitive dissonance it's these ideas. As, as you know u.s supported taiwan against the communist china it's just unfortunate that Chiang kai she was a dictator of taiwan right but now now yes. if we just got get rid of kmt regime everything will be good which is why their idea of, um, form, of of internationalism, like these petty bourgeois, like DPP supporters, is not solidarity with the world's oppressed peoples, but solidarity with American and Japanese people. And also solidarity with the compradors in the third world. Not not the people of the third world, but like the compradors who are still um, who still maintain diplomatic ties with the government on Taiwan. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's just such a weird... Um... Like as a result of you know the the KMT mismanagement of the popular discontent in Taiwan itself, that after the KMT rule come to an end in Taiwan, you know Taiwan is one of the I think it's the only East Asian countries where like Japan colonial rule kind of remember almost like fondly, right? I mean like in places like Korea, China. You know, Philippines, Indonesia, everybody remembered, you know, the Japanese colonial time was bad, bad time. But but Taiwan is like the one exception that it was like almost, oh, you know, yeah, the, the, the Japanese were initially brutal, but at least they, they build us infrastructure. They're, they're better oh, they'll, than- say things, they'll, they'll say things like, you know, like our, um, our good manners, our obedience of the law and our good citizens citizenry are all um things that japan blessed us with so we became more civilized after japanese yes. colonization yes yes and i'm just like fuck you yeah yeah that that's unfortunate and but that's i, I that became a, a like like mainstream really after uh you know after the lead and hui era and it, a lot of a lot of that come kind of come um I think it, it, it come started under the Lin Hui era. It kind of just got solidified under yeah. Chen Sui Bian, right? It's weird because economically, like under Jiang Jingguo, there were close economic ties with, ties with Japan, but like culturally, like they, the KMT did what it felt was necessary to get rid of Japanese influence as much as it could from Taiwanese society. But like the Deng Hui has always been like really pro Japan. Like he still goes to Japan and gives talks and gives talks in Japanese. He says he says the um, Diao Yu Dao belongs to Japan. Yeah, that is so. I mean, it, it's just it, you know, Li Denghui. I think probably the worst case, but um, you know, Diao Yu Dao or so called Senkaku by the Japanese. It, 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 if at all, it's closest to Taiwan, and physically, it's closest to Taiwan. When it was a and, Japanese colony. Those islands were administered as part of as part of Taiwan yeah, by the exactly, Japanese. Exactly, exactly. And then the, the only reason that currently there was a dispute is because 
the U.S. It's because, exactly, because after World War II, um, U.S. occupied uh, the, the Ryukyu Island chain, right, including Okinawa, and they also occupied uh, the Diaoyu Islands, and they, they use the Diao, the U.S. military used the Diaoyu Diao Dao as like a target practice, right? And then, then of course, Chiang Kai-shek regime, which relied on the U.S. support, had no objections. <laughs> but, but then in 1972, um, when U.S. finally decided to transfer uh, the Ryukyu island chain, which had been under U.S. kind of uh, uh, administration after World War II, back to Japan, uh, and then they, when they did that, they transfer along uh, with Ryukyu Island chain, the transfer uh, administration of Diaoyu Islands to Japan. So, so this is really an issue. That's when 1972. That's when like the the dispute surfaced because then then you know both the RO, both the Chiang Kai Shek government and the Beijing government protested this this U.S. U.S. action, and and then that the dispute became like between U.S. between China and Japan on, over the ownership of those islands, and and but throughout Chiang Kai Shek's rule, throughout KMT rule, you know the the KMT on Taiwan had maintained Diao Yu Tao was part of Taiwan, but but I but, mean it's still maintained that way, like officially. Official. If you go to the post office, if you go to the post office in Taiwan, if you buy if you buy like the standard post office envelopes on the back, you'll see all the postal codes codes for all the cities and counties, um of um Taiwan. And like the, the very last zip code is the one for Diao Yu Dao. Yeah, that's that's a weird thing about Taiwan. You have these Taiwan political leaders, you know, starting from Li Denghui, and then later, <coughs> I believe also um, either <coughs> Yu Xiulian or Chen Sui Bian, uh, and maybe even Tsai Ing Wen have said, you know, yeah, yeah, you know, Diao Yu Dao is should be part of Japan. <laughs> and then, but but then on the ground, they actually don't. You know, they, they, they haven't done any, they didn't alter kind of the, 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 the older claims and stuff like that. So it's, it's kind of this weird dynamic. Yeah. It's, um, so after um, Chen Sui Bian's victory, um, Li Donghui kind of leaves the KMT. You know, he's kind of like, my mission's done. So the newly incumbent DPP has a few problems. Because um, throughout Chen Shui-bian's leadership, the KMT dominated legislative yuan or like kind of the parliament was um, dominated by the KMT. And cross-strait cross relations became very complicated because the DPP won through, you know, anti-mainland ID poll. But realistically, they weren't going to pursue formal Taiwan independence. So this kind of has a problem because how do you how do you deal with this but not make your voters feel betrayed? You're not going to change Republic of China to Republic of Taiwan. You're not going to formally declare independence. And so what the do you do? And also the reality was that the Taiwanese economy was increasingly integrated with mainland uh, because you know the 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 PRC government pursue a policy since 1980s. Basically, you build it, they will come, right? They they starting to uh, giving a lot of privileges to uh, overseas investors from Taiwan and Hong Kong, and like including tax benefits and land benefits, and then they that attracted a lot of capital to mainland China, and also on top of that, because you know much cheaper labor labor cost. Um, so a lot of the Taiwan businessmen were flocking to invest in mainland on top of, you know, of course, due to the close cultural ties. And then, you know, with, with and the... keep in mind, this included Ben Shengren. So the DPP couldn't totally piss off these um, businessmen. Yes, yes, because they, you know, it's not that the, the those businessmen necessarily pro-China, but they're pro-money. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's they the problem. Tried, um, mainland China's policy for so long has been build it, they'll come, and then they've they've like kind of sucked up to um, Taiwanese capitalists. Not, not sucked up, but you know, giving them lots of benefits, thinking, hey, that will transfer over to the Taiwanese people and it'll gain their support. Yeah, but those people in Taiwan are also seen as opportunists. Yes, nobody likes them. So like, 
they're kind of they're they're not trustworthy allies, and I think the CP and the the, the CCP should really re. I, I think it kind of is starting to reevaluate these things, but it's oh, there's a big mess to clean up. Basically, yes, yes. I mean, like that. Well, I mean, that's also getting tied up with you know China's internal development because back in the eighties, China was trying to have it was capital starved, so it was trying to attract overseas capital yes, and, and priorities. And, then yes, and overseas Chinese were the largest source of capital investment into mainland China in 1980s. And then following 1989 Tiananmen Square protest, there was a Western sanction placed on China. So, so you know, in the early 90s, when the Chinese economy furtherly opened up, it is mostly, you know, Chinese capital from Hong Kong, Taiwan, oh, South Tiananmen East. protest, why ta Taiwan had a, um, the Tiananmen, the sanctions resulting from the Tiananmen Square um, incident mm -hmm. benefited Taiwan in a certain way because Taiwan was not really affected by the sanctions. Yes, because of its legal gray area. Yes, yes, so, yes, and that that's Taiwan did why capital, I, Taiwanese capitalists did did um capitalize on the sanctions. And and then uh, I think that that's why like. Also, that that kind of emboldened Li Denghui, right? I mean, like, because uh, because um, I, I remember during the Li Denghui era, the, the, the talk is that yeah, we can, we are basically, uh, you know, this kind of uh, we're already independent. We don't need to pursue formal independence. Exactly, exactly. And also, you know, Taiwan had at the time this was when tech boom was taking off in U.S. and and the Taiwan economy. It, it has a lot, uh, you know, in large part, kind of integrated with that, with with the U.S. You know, with supplying parts, you know, yes. for building PCs like Acer, right? And like Acer, a lot of Asus, some um, D-Link, TP-Link, um, and um, a lot of the um, like what, and the like semiconductors, ITDN, semiconductors, right? yes, yeah, TSMC, the the, the they the Taiwan Foxconn, yeah, and and and, and yeah, Foxconn, they. But but then when mainland opened up, of course Foxconn went over to mainland to open up factories to to utilize the the, the, the Chinese mainland labor. And and one of the movie I remember that was very popular, uh, Taiwan movie that was very popular in Indonesia in the nineteen nineties was uh, Shaolin Shaozi. In, in Indonesia, they they call it the Boboho. Uh, my my fiance knows about it. She because it was very popular as a comedy. And it's it, I, I watch a little bit of it, and then it's very important. Like it, this was made in early 90, 90s, uh, like ninety four, right? It's in the Denghui era, but just before the <clears throat> nineteen ninety six election. And and one of the theme in the movie was that the dad was going over to mainland to open a factory. Right, <laughs> so it was very, very kind of in, in in line with the times, and and the and and also you know like it's obvious from the movie it's the the, the uh, back in the nineties, people in Taiwan still identify as Chinese. Yes, I I still remember that like when I was a kid. Yeah, I think um like when I was because um I was born in nineteen ninety three. So like when I first started developing memories and stuff, I remembered you know Li Donghui as the leader of Taiwan, and I remember even in like Tainan, which is like, and it's just in southern Taiwan. It's um it's, it's a um what, what's the word? It's one of the mo the most um pro DPP areas of Taiwan. Even then, people even back then, people there called themselves um Chinese. Yeah, yeah, and then. And then, uh, but Li Denghui was also, he tried to put a stop to like kind of the, he was, a, uh, he was, he was afraid of further uh, economic integration with mainland. So that's when Li Denghui first proposed the Go South strategy, which encouraged, he tried to limit the Taiwanese investment on mainland and trying to redirect uh, some of this investment towards Southeast Asia to places like Vietnam, Cambodia, Indonesia, and other parts, uh, because he said, you know, we should not be overly dependent on the the, the, the mainland. Uh, but as as time goes, I mean, that strategy is uh, I hasn't really worked because you know mainland. It's just be, because of sheer size and the, the cultural affinity. You know, there's. Uh, uh, 
Uh, and and eventually, when the mainland economy develop itself, you know, mainland China become a huge market for the for the, uh, and that that additionally drawing in more Taiwan businesses. So yeah. yeah. So what did Chen Shui-bian do to kind of show that he was still pro-independence, but without actually declaring independence? He did little things, like I mentioned how, um, for example, there was a um, there was some state-owned enterprises in Taiwan. One of them was called the Chinese Petroleum Company, this um, Zhongguo Shiyou. He changed the name of that to Central Petroleum Company, and um, and just Zhongyou. He wanted to change it to Taiwan Shiyou, but I think that name was already registered or something. So then he couldn't. So he just changed it to Zhong Tai. He changed it to Zhongyou, and then added Taiwan to the beginning of it. So it's Taiwan Zhongyou. Ah. It's just funny because even when even in the two thousands when I go there, what they did was instead of making new signs, what they did was um they just took off the two characters in the middle. But because they've been on for so long, you can see the outlines of the characters. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. So before it was Zhongguo Shiyou, right? So they just took out. Guo and Shi, yeah. <laughs> but then because the characters have been on for so long, they're the colors different, so you can see like the outlines of them. Yeah, yeah. L- little, and then he changed um the 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 postal service in Taiwan from um Zhonghua Youzheng, which is in English is called um Zhonghua Post. Zhonghua is like another name for like China. Yep. To Taiwan Post, but then that was undone in two thousand eight by the KMT. All right. After my because Ma Angel said he didn't he he didn't want my Angel said he didn't want his um the stamps for his inauguration to say um Taiwan Youzheng on them. <laughs> <laughs> and then um before uh, if you're old enough you'll remember before the two thousands, Taiwan's passports never said Taiwan on them. They still don't say Taiwan in Chinese on them today. Back then, uh, all they said was Republic of China yeah. passport. Yeah, I, I mean. Only- even when um you know I I was in U.S. since 1990. I remember even when uh, the uh, <clears throat> back when you know China, Taiwan was still manufacturing things <laughs> to export to U.S. Uh, um, like I see on the, the on the tags, I still see tags that says "Made in ROC," right? Made in Republic yeah. of China. Yeah. 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 Um, and so little things like that. The passports. So nowadays the passports. They still look the same, but then they'll say Taiwan in English on the bottom. Yes, and then like on a lot of um like a lot of things that have Republic of China in them, he, he added Taiwan in parentheses. Just little little things like this. There yeah. was recently there's been talks to rename um China Airlines to Taiwan Airlines. Ah yes, I I used to be so confused. Like um, I remember trying to book and like. China Airlines. I couldn't tell whether that's like from the mainland China. There's Guahang and there's Guahang. <laughs> yes, yes. So um, so th- I I read on Weibo, people and people on Weibo are like, actually, you know what? We support it. That way, it'll end the two China situation in the airline industry. <laughs> and then they're like, you guys are a province. Like, what gives you the right to have a um national airline? Change it to Taiwan. <laughs> change it to Taiwan Airlines. We're for it. <laughs> Oh, so so it will be like because you know for people who don't know in, in China a lot of provinces they have their own airlines. So there's a Highline Hai airline, airline, right? More, more famous is Highline airline. So basically they're saying you know you 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 have the same status as the Taiwan airline will have same status as Highline Hai airline, right? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So then when the DVP goes in, it also has a lot of issues because um until then they've um had a lot of experience in undermining the KMT and rebelling against the KMT, but they have no experience in building up Taiwan. It's kind of like how um, a lot of the um, a lot of the pseudo left in the West, they're against capitalism and they say, oh, we're going to tear this stuff down. We're going to tear this stuff down. But then um, what are you going to that's that alone doesn't win people over in the long run. What are you going to off? What are you going to offer them afterwards after you tear everything down? Right. Yes, so, yes. There's I there's remember. a destructive aspect of okay, this isn't a revolution, but I'm just going to use revolutionary logic. There's rev, there's revolutionary there's um a destructive aspect. We're going to tear down the old system, but then on top of the ashes of the old system, you need to construct something new and you need to promise people, you know, stability, increase in, in, increase standards of living and that sort of stuff. That's why Lenin had the whole peace land and bread. You see like Stalin was basically the um kind of the combination of the two, 
that's yeah, why he that, was like kind of he was he was conservative in some ways like like you know appealing to people who just want stable lives and stuff you wanted okay we're gonna have socialism in one country we're and then we're gonna build ourselves up first before we really focus on you know exporting revolution whereas you know the trotskyists were like no we need permanent revolution we need to just we need to just keep on doing revolution and make the whole world socialist otherwise our revolution is going to fail but as people don't want that people the average person doesn't want you know this constant this constant upheaval Most remember like war communism, war communism and and during the civil war and the soviet union was terrible for most people yeah, most people just want to lead stable lives and have have the ability to pursue, you know, have a family, provide for them, and 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 have, just, let their kids have better lives than they did. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, and 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 that's um, that's so that's one of the thing I kind of uh, you know I have my criticism for Noam Chomsky because initially I, I i when i first came to us i was attracted to noam chomsky's writings and and that later I, later i realized you know he offered very good critique of Amer us imperialism abroad but like 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 he Every doesn't genuine really... attempt to create some to create an alternative is also equally if not more criticized by him yes and and then what what end up happening is you know, he provides this very nice, uh, you know, like this uh, kind of respectable criticism of, of U.S. imperialism. But in the end, it's harmless because it doesn't. It's like Winston Churchill. Yeah, this system is bad, but it's the best system out of all of the bad systems. Exactly. Exactly. It, 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 in the end, it's kind of like this harmless opposition, right? I mean, like, like yes, he offers criticism of the system, but it doesn't offer alternative to change it. In the end, it means nothing it means you know okay noam chomsky continue to criticize but but things go on as it is yes so then to deal with um so the dp the dpp doesn't really have like experience running a society so then they decide to use centrist or anti-kmt bureaucrats with experience running and one of them is actually tsai ing-wen who was today's leader she um she was head of the mainland affairs council yeah, Taiwan has like this this thing called the Mainland Affairs Council, which is because you can't because it still recognizes the ROC as the sole legitimate government of China, and you can't just change the constitution easily. So then you can't deal with Mainland Affairs through the um, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So you have to have this separate council that deals explicitly with Mainland Affairs. It's kind of yeah, the um the Mainland. The mainland um, counterpart to it is called the Guo Tai Ban. I forgot what it's called in English, but it's basically like the Taiwan Affairs thing. So immediately there's power struggles within the DPP because um, the newly joined bureaucrats have executive power, but they're more they're more conservative and they're just all about you know keeping the way things are to maintain stability and you know keep everyone that you know who benefits from them happy. And then that puts them at odds with the more um, radical members of the DPP, like the ones who um, were involved in Dang Wai and like the early, the Formosa incident and like the people who really had, had the visionaries who had ideas of what a um, better Taiwanese society would look like. So what you see is a lot of um, those OGs getting with, with more, um, you know, so-called revolutionary ideals being sidelined. And the people who were left are, you know, the, the the opportunists, like the bureaucrats and the lawyers. And the lawyers refer to, like, the people like, you know, Liu Xiolian, Yu uh, Xikun, uh, Su Zhenchang, Xie Changting, those people. And they, they maintain their power with them, you know, separatist ID poll to get votes. Of, like, all these people, Liu Xiolian was the... Only Liu Xiolian was a member of the Formosa Magazine editorial team. And um, Yu Xikun was a career politician starting in, starting in the 1980s. Whereas Su Zhenchang and Xie Changting were lawyers who got famous after the um, Kaohsiung incident. So um, I guess now is the time you kind of want to get into the education system. Yes. 
Yes. Okay. I think we can go to the education system, and then I'll give a little bit more information about Chen Suibian, and I think that'll be a good stopping point for today, because I think if we try to get to like get to like twenty twenty, there's like a lot of stuff to cover, like no, the, on no. the sunflower and stuff. Yeah, like that. we we let's let's just go through the nineties and then go yeah. through early two thousand. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So um, from I think I mentioned this in the first episode actually, but it was kind of out of place there. So basically, from you know, during Chen Suibian's leadership, and and shortly afterwards, so from like around 2000 to 2010, the Ministry of Education changed the education curriculum guidelines for history classes two times, meaning that in just one decade there were a total of three versions of the um, curriculum, and this coincided with the um, DPP's policy of desinitization. The major changes came in the 2006 curriculum guidelines. and Because prior to that, Taiwanese history was considered like a subcategory of Chinese history, but then now the two are separated. Yeah, like, was, like I said before, the seeds of um, desinitization began during the deep, began before the DPP took power in 2000. But it was when Chen shui entered office that it really took off. So um, a lot of things, like what they make of the, the February 28th incident is like, um, it kind of because it was left out of Taiwan's history curriculum until 1990, like there was no alternative viewpoint that was presented to the people. So then it was like an area of free reign for the DPP. And um, it, while it used to be taught as like, um, like while, while these while the pro beginning problems of um, Taiwan, Taiwan's um, rule under the KMT were treated as like kind of related to the Sino-Japanese war. Now it's kind of now things like um, the February 28th incident are taught as like the beginning point of modern Taiwanese history. So, you know, like I said, um, DPP um, free reign because for a lot of historical revisionism because it was left kind of untouched. So nowadays, it's mostly presented as a simple matter of um, the KMT, which was made up of Wai Shengren from the mainland massacring Taiwanese people. Whereas it was a lot more complicated than that. There were massacres by the um by the KMT, but it was certainly not a um, just a strictly anti-Taiwanese thing. It was it was it was anti whoever challenged the KMT's authority. And what's also left out was um, in response, a lot of um, just mainland civilians, like Wai Sheng civilians, were also during that time when the massacre happened, because it lasted th it lasted over a duration of a couple of weeks. It wasn't just like a single day thing. Um, in fact, the KMT's response with the military didn't begin until March. And you like, yeah, so a lot of like main, like Wai Sheng civilian who were in Taiwan were also just beaten to death, like even gang raped, beaten by like just Taiwanese thugs. And then there's also this whole thing where, like, the historical revisionism now is that also the reinterpretation of the Cairo, uh, the the what is it, the Cairo Declaration and the Potsdam Potsdam Declaration to uh, make it seem like, oh, Taiwan's legal status and in international politics is undetermined. There is also um, um, just a lot of identity politics stuff, basically, and. Nowadays, the it's really uh, victims easy of to, it's really easy to do, right? Uh, because yes. identity politics, uh, you know, like we all—it's not all, something all, you study; it's something you feel. Exactly, and and identity is about you know who, who what group you are born into, and and also um, you know like we talk about the characters of uh, 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 of two two eight incident it's very incendiary it's 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 i mean it's clearly a a, a great injustice of uh, you know uh, caused by the by the kmt rule but like as you mentioned it, it was done without the class analysis right and like a yes. lot of uh and also on 
in a in a kind of mass movement like two two a uh two two a incident you know it's 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 like it two two a incident is very i think it's it, it's a very illuminating in a way that uh, like we mentioned before because um you know the 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 people who are perpetuating the the misrule on taiwan are this is a kmt elite but the people who came with the KMT, the you know all the other mainlanders, uh, you know all the soldiers and their family, became identified with the KMT elite just because you know they they you know they they then then they became target also target of attack for for revenge because it's a lot easier to uh, identify someone by say their their origin right the, what dialect so they speak. I. Uh... Inadvertently, these people, these um anti-mainland, like mainlanders, actually helped the KMT gain like a group of reliable um supporters in yes. these um in these mainland civilians. Yes, because now the KMT can be like, hey, these people hate you. Now we're here to protect you. Yes, we're all white Yes, and, and then that... there's also during. Sorry, go, go on. on. No, go ahead. No, you. you... I have no. I'm just going to say that that kind of dynamic kind of just reinforce the uh, kind of the the, the divide uh, uh, between groups in Taiwan, right? Into in solidified into Benson's and versus Weissens and uh, politics, and and that's what the DPP were able to capitalize on. It's like us versus them. That's always the best way to uh, you know divide and conquer and and getting your getting most votes because you know demographically on Taiwan you know that the the whites the and then and their descendants you know only compose what like 15 percent of the population right and then the 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 the, 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 the if the if the DPP can just um, emphasize on this divide and appeal to the, the majority right and then they, they can that's a that's a path to electoral victory yes and then another part of this um Historical revisionism is the downplaying of um, the cruelty of Japanese rule, which is yes. why, like today, even though Taiwan's gone through fifty difficult years of Japanese occupation, Taiwan's youth are largely pro-Japan. I mean, you even see things like uh, saying, you know, the um, the so-called comfort women or the sex slaves. Here, there's debate on whether or not they were forced. Like, they're, like they're like, okay, well, you know, some of them did it. Some of the some of them did it, like you know, voluntarily, while others were captured and stuff. And well. What think about it? What kind of people? The I'm I'm speaking of like I'm like broadly like what kind of people end up like you know voluntarily going into it? They're economically desperate. It's still an exploitation of the precarious economic situations yes. and the fact that you know under the social hierarchy of the Japanese overlords, you know yes. like Taiwanese people were like second grade citizens. Yes. It's also kind of funny about the hierarchy, speaking of which, um, there is also um, a group of Japanese people who were born in Taiwan, and then um, after retrocession, they went back to Japan. It's funny because um, they were, they're called Taisei in, in Japanese, or Taisheng, which means born uh, in Taiwan. Yeah. So they're like a notch above Taiwanese people, but then when they went back to Japan, they were looked down upon because they spoke Japanese with a Taiwanese accent. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Whereas in Taiwan, they thought they were like superior and like they would tell like they would say things like, well, you're just a Taiwanese. I'm like, you know, Japanese. And there was that sort of it's called yes. it's almost kind of like um, in Taiwan. They'll be like in Taiwan, they'll be like, yeah, well, back in the day when like white superiority was more of a thing, they'll be like, you know, or whatever. But then when they, if they went to the mainland at the time, they would just be like mainlanders would just be like, dude, no, you're, you're, you're Taiwanese. Yeah. Basically, yeah, well, except that, that that's not how it works because you know, like because mainland uh, China in eighties when when the first the Taiwanese uh, um, uh, restriction were lifted on travel to mainland, you know, at that time, you know, Taiwan's much more economically developed than mainland, so people were welcoming. <laughs> the, yeah, the well, yeah, yeah, yeah. But then they would still call these people Taiwanese, even if they were like white Shenmen. Yeah. Is what I'm saying. Yeah. Oh, exactly. For, for the, the, the dynamics, for the people, totally different. Yeah, yeah. That's that's a very interesting point because for for from the perspective of the people on the mainland, 
you know, if people from Taiwan, whether they're Benson and Weisson, then they're all Taiwan, then, right? <laughs> Nowadays, that's also the case in Taiwan, but until like the 90s or the 80s, like that wasn't the case. Yeah. So it's it's kind of it's kind of strange. Like it was strange yeah, for I mean, me to figure that stuff out as a kid. Now we're that we're talking about the DPP. Um, we touched briefly about the Huaminghua Yundong, where there's the the program of Japanization of the Taiwanese, which um you know like like I mentioned before, you could you know become a formal um royal sub uh subject of the emperor, and um you adopt these certain customs and whatever. At the at the time, however, only two percent of Taiwan's population did become Huangmin. And they largely came from the wealthy landowning class. And notable descendants of Huang Min are Li Donghui, Tsai Ing-wen, Ke Wenzhou. So the current leader of Taiwan, Tsai Ing-wen, her father in his youth was sent to northeastern China or Manchuria to repair airplanes for the Imperial Japanese Army. So does it really surprise you when she's pro-Japan? This is like, uh, this reminds me of, you know, that the previous South Korean leader, uh, Park, uh, what's Park her name? Uh, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, you know, like, um, how, just before the President Moon, Moon Jae-in. Park Geun-hye. Yes, because she was the daughter, right, of the former uh, South Korean dictator, and, and who was actually served in the, in the IJA. Uh, yeah, he who actually served in the Japanese Guangdong Army in Manchuria. <laughs> yeah, he was fighting Kim Il Sung. Yep. Like, the um diff- one major difference though was um Taiwan's military was you know brought over by the KMT. So like none of the generals there were like really you know IJA people. But in South Korea, like a lot of the generals that ended up make that ended up being a lot of the generals in the South Korean army were originally IJA um, soldiers. So there's a slightly different dynamic over there. Yeah, yeah, because the U.S. Uh, U.S. kind of uh, propping up of the, the South Korean military dictatorship, a lot of the co- co- Japanese occupation era collaborators stayed on, stayed in power, basically. Yeah. Yup. Um, I also want to point out um, I, a, a few a, a few weeks ago, um, I guess notable notable in the leftist community, notable figure in the leftist community, um, Caleb Maupin made a status saying, "Oh, the, you know, many of the so-called natives in Taiwan are actually descendants of Japanese people," and that's just blatantly false. That's a misunderstanding of Taiwanese history. There's l- very little descendants of Japanese people remained in Taiwan. You have some people who you know might have a little bit of mixed heritage with Japanese, but no, it's most of the so-called native people are Han Chinese Ben Seng Ren. And it so happens that some of the deep people in power, well, not just so happens, of course, of course, class politics are at play. Like people like Tsai Ing-wen, Li Donghui and stuff, they're descendants of Huang Min, who were, they're still Han Chinese, like Taiwanese people, but ones who swore loyalty to the Japanese emperor as a result of the time and for, you know, for that sort of status. And it reflects a certain class position but like Tsai Ing-wen is not, and Li Denghui, they're not descendants of Japanese people. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like the most, I mean, Japan did send a huge number of settlers to its former colonies, including Taiwan, Manchuria, uh, and Korea. But 1945, uh, as after the defeat of Japan in World War II, there was a repatriation program. You know, yes. most of the Japanese people went home to Japan. Yes, yes. So, um, this I guess this marks the end of um, the first uh, the first term of Chen Shui-bian's leadership. Nothing too um, spectacular, you know. So, um, I guess when did now's a good she, time. Uh, of... When did when did the Chen Shui-bian's uh, government, uh, you know, do do the of the economy to selling off the state-owned uh, enterprises in Taiwan. Did that happen in the second term? I th- no, it happened throughout. It happened um in the ni- it happened in the nineties and two thousands. Oh, so you started under Li Denghui. Kind of, yeah. I remember when Ma Angel was mayor and mayor of Taipei. Like one of the banks was um privatized. 
Ah. One of the major, yeah. Okay. So like, it's it's like the neoliberalization, like because a lot of these um government um credit cooperatives, they were like the go to source for you know poor people or whatever to secure loans or what or stuff of that stuff of that nature. Yeah. Like there was still some sort of like protect like guarantees by the government, whereas like completely privatized like the bank, they could be a, a lot more discriminatory and um in the way they yeah, loan because, money to people. Because DMP made a big issue about, you know, how KMT was controlling a large sector's economy over their kind of ownership previously through like all these state owned enterprises, right? And then that that's like they had to dismantle that kind of as like dismantling of the KMT rule and KMT power. It's like a package uh, deal. You get rid of one thing that's like bad, but you also get rid of things that, you know, are better than what they are now. Yeah. 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 So Chen Sui Bian, he's a dude from a uh, Tainan County. Well, Tainan County and city are now the same after um after like I think 10 years ago something like that. But anyways, mm. he's from rural Tainan. My mom's yeah. from like the city of Tainan, like yeah. this, um the yeah the central the city center of Tainan. So kind of kind of same area. He was born to uh, I, I think his mom Chen Shui-bian's mom was illiterate. That's just um, the level of poverty poverty that mm-hmm. he was in. Yeah. He's like a he's a um, example of working hard in school and kind of making it but it wasn't all just him working hard he also he also um ran into a lot of luck he studied law at national taiwan university which is um the one of the which is the most prestigious university in taiwan he became a lawyer in um 1973 so he got his license then and he started by then he was um by then he was married to his to his wife wu suzhen and she's from a wealthy family. I think um her I think her her parents were doctors. So Chen Shui-bian opened up a law office with money that was lent or given to him by his father-in-law. So he went it was like rags to riches. And then he eventually became a lawyer in the um, you know, the aforementioned Kaohsiung incident or the Formosa magazine incident. And um he people were surprised when he got caught in an embezzlement scandal during his second term but if you look at if you look at the numbers he was already getting into sketchy shit when he was the mayor of Taipei from 1994 to 1998 he um his net worth cuz you know you had to report your um your assets and stuff when you when you run for office. So in 1995, the lowest valuation of his net worth was um, 69,179,364 Taiwan dollars, which according to the foreign exchange rate at the time was worth um, 2 million, like 2.6 million, which is worth um, 4.4 million in today's dollars. So, um, approximately 4 million new, um, new Taiwan dollars were in stocks. The rest was mostly in real estate. Now, his net worth in 1999, the lowest valuation was um, 173 million, uh, 173.88 million, which according to foreign exchange rates at the time was worth, um, let's see, 5.4 million US dollars, which in today's dollars is worth 8.37 million US dollars. And approximately 50 million new Tau NTD were in stocks. The rest was mostly in real estate. So did his, porf- did his stock portfolio increase that much in value or did he buy more shares? And uh, the answer is the latter. His portfolio went from um, 68,800 shares to 1.5 million shares. And if we assume that he did not spend a single cent of his salary as mayor, his wealth his wealth increase would have only been a little over eight million NTD, which is worth um which was worth two hundred forty seven point uh, nine eight thousand in nineteen ninety nine or three hundred eighty five 
thousand in um, today's dollars. So you kind of see if you, I guess if you were really inclined to, you can pause and just write all these numbers down and do the math. So when he ran for um, um, Taiwanese leader, he ran on the platform of anti-corruption. And um, and his his net worth just doubled. <laughs> it's, it's like how, how how do you how do you double your how do you nearly double your wealth in just four years? And in addition to his large increase in stock holdings, his cash holdings also went from, um, uh, I think, eleven point eleven point six eight million Taiwan dollars to fifty three point three eight million Taiwan dollars, which it nearly quintupled. Like, how? Of course, there's corruption. So, um, basically, two thousand four. Lian Zhan ran again. Lian Zhan, the, the KMT candidate from 2000. This time with Song Chuyu as his running mate. And the polls were 50-50 between Lian and Chen. But then there was a quote-unquote assassination attempt on Chen Shui-bian. That garnered a bunch of sympathy votes. And Lian Zhan lost to Chen Shui-bian by just 30,000 votes. Yeah, so basically, that, I remember that election. It was really weird. It's just literally on the eve of the election and and there's some supposed freak uh, assassination on Chen Shui-bian, uh, which barely made it. It was shot change. at an angle so that it would go just right through his, um, like, it would just kind of scathe him a little bit. Yeah. Not actually penetrate him. And yeah. then I think in the team, because, like, he was doing a rally, like, one of the people in that group was, like, a white huh, who specializes in, like, bullet wounds. Mm. So, I mean, was it... Was it a planned like was it was it fake, or is it an actual assassination attempt? You know, I, I, you're inclined to your own views, but I I tend to believe that it was it was done for show. It's uh, whatever it was that that event helped him to propel him to a second term. Yes, two bullets. If Trump is if. Trump, if you're worried about your re-election, just look to the 2004 election in Taiwan and learn a thing or two from it. It might help you out. Just saying. <laughs> oh, brother. Something to consider. Um, so, once again, you know, ID poll, anti-KMT slogans. The um, the leadership throughout the, four, the first four years didn't really bring the people the hope and change they sought. And the economy wasn't really doing well. And then there was also the um the whole corruption scandal so basically um it was discovered that Chen Shui-bian had a bunch of um just a bunch of money in i think Swiss bank accounts and yeah he ended up getting thrown in prison after I mean, the, Taiwan politics has always been known for you know corruption Option. right there's a, there's yeah. a term called hedging right the the black gold and and the, refer to to the buying of votes in taiwan and then the um but the you know the the, the ten sui bian's main electoral platform was to cleaning up the election and it turns out he would just the same as the other Taiwan politicians that gone before him. I was reading and, his book, and it's just like very stereotypical, like third way politician. Like, like I said, like I mentioned before, how like you know Taiwan's democratization coincided with um, the um, the counter revolutions in the so the socialist bloc, right? Yeah, we we briefly talk about. Yeah, that. so like in his book, he's always talking about like, oh my, oh my. My political idols are people like Tony Blair and and um, Bill Clinton, and like wow. now they're going for like a a path of, of a new central new centrism, which which proves something. People all over the world are are disgusted with extreme left and extreme right politics. We need to find the perfect balancing point where we can secure you know um, a better social safety net for the middle class and also like let businesses thrive and this this and that. And he was just talking about um, how um, he is. His book talks about how he played an important historical role as um, as someone who helped lead Taiwan in its first successful successful um, 
change of party leadership, which is hilarious because the person the person he lost to was Song Chuyu, and Song Chuyu wasn't in the KMT at that time. He was part of the Qimindang. So even if Song Chuyu had won, it still would have been a change in the party. It was still would have been like he was like, yeah, you know, his words were like, um, Taiwan is going with the um. Going with the latest trends of international politics and is standing in the right side of history as we're getting rid of one party domination and moving towards true democracy with multiple parties. It was just his book was filled with all, all those sorts of um. Do you think rhetoric. he actually write the book or he was ghost written? I don't know because I try imagining it in his voice and it sounds like him talking. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but um, I, the, the the point is, it doesn't matter though, because the point is that's the impression that he wants to give the yes. people. I doubt he really believes half of that bullshit. And then, but then there were also parts of the book that talk that really show you like what the relationship between the U.S. and um, Taiwan were like, because it was talking about how he attended a wedding. I think it was his daughter's wedding or something. I forgot, and how he had a letter in his suit from like and it had to do with um 911 attacks and how to deal with it and like how he had the military on standby in case anything happened and I'm just like what does Taiwan have to do with fucking 911 why is the military on alert like what wh- why yeah yeah i mean unfortunately it's one of those things where you know like like something that happens in you know, people, even in people in East Asia, they pay more attention to things that happen in Washington or Paris or, you know, like that. It's it's it, 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 that that somehow is supposed to be unless it's bad things like Snowden. <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. 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 So, I mean, so, um, yeah, go on. No, no, no. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I remember it was like a great shift because um when I was when I was little in the nineties, I remember like, you know, it wasn't controversial in Taiwan to call yourself Chinese. But then by the time I was in third grade, that was um I was in third grade from two thousand one to two thousand two. This around that time, um I was in Taiwan for the summer and my cousins were who were just like a few years older than me, they started saying things like no, we're not Chinese. We're Taiwanese, and um, Taiwan is an independent country. So you can see how like they, they get them young, you know. This was uh this was nineteen nineties. No, no. When this happened, this was in the early two thousands. Ah, okay, okay, yeah, yeah. And I think it's yeah. a process that kind of started in under the Den Hui era, but like kind of in the stealth mode. It's kind of in stealth mode. <laughs> Yeah, but under Chen Sui Bian, it was full. Uh, it was it was full out in the open, and and you know Chen Sui Bian is one of those figures where you know he started out his career in opposition as this guy who you know actually went to jail for. He did went to jail, right? I believe he was arrested. Yes, yes. And uh, you know, it's, uh, went to jail against the dictatorship of Jiang Kai Shek, uh, KMT government, and then, and then you know this is. Uh, this is supposed to be almost like a Nelson Mandela story, right? But but in the end, it turns out uh, when he's actually empowered, the DPP turns out to be not that different <laughs> from the KMT government before it, and 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 so to distinguish themselves from the KMT, they increasingly rely on identity politics, like oh, you know, we are. Uh, you know that that means you know historical revision. Uh, that you know it's just 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 all, all the things that um, it, it, it kind of makes sense in a way because you know to to you know what's the other alternative you know to to actually what improve people's lives <laughs> and to 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 uh, provide better governance to 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 like. Uh, uh, to 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 build up the Taiwanese society? No, that's that reco- that takes hard work, right? I mean, it's, <laughs> it's a lot easier to take the existing divisions within Taiwan society along identity lines, heighten it, and 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 then 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 rouse people's emotions, and then you know use that to win votes. You see, that's a lot easier. Yes, and um, like it's kind of it's it's. You can note how um, during that time, 
because the DPP's party platform, the party program does talk about how it wants to form a Republic of Taiwan through a referendum. So, um, but when the DPP was in power, it kind of started a referendum, but then it blocked it. Which means they're not, they're not really, like, if you think about it, the DPP wants independence no more than the KMT wants reunification. If Taiwan truly became a Republic of Taiwan and it became de jure independent, there would there's no more um there's no more um scapegoat for Taiwan's problems. You can't rely on these these identity politics things won't be won't be reliable anymore because now the the rhetoric is Taiwan's economy and all this stuff is doing bad because mainland China is oppressing Taiwan and excluding Taiwan from um, participating in international organizations. But I mean it's it's per, it's Taiwan is prohibited from entering as as a country, but not in other forms. I mean, whether or not this is right or wrong is up for debate. I'm not going to comment too much on it, but if you think about it, like Cuba is recognized as a sovereign country because it is. But can you really say that Taiwan is more isolated globally than Cuba? Taiwan's not subject to the same economic and political sanctions that Cuba is. Again, this is uh, <clears throat> kind of place to the to the people. It's 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 about pride, right? It's about dignity, <laughs> right? And you know, it's about you know, you can hold a Taiwan pass passport to other countries and and be recognized of, as from Taiwan than being associated with with China, which. In, in a lot of people's mind in Taiwan at the at the time in the early two thousand is still like this this backward place <laughs> with a lot of poor people. It's not not the not the image they want to be associated with. Yes, it's kind of like um the whole I'm not Chinese. My parents are Chinese. I'm American, but on a whole societal level. Yeah, yeah, but except so, um, like that's that's that's. Yeah, a little bit different, not exactly. But then because um basically people were fed up with the DPP at that time. So Mindjo won election in 2008. Mindjo's um just your quintessential like second generation Waishengren in Taiwan. He was actually born not in Taiwan but in Hong Kong. But then moved to Taiwan when he was like a little kid. His parents are from uh Hunan. So I guess he's um he's distant cousins with Mao, or not not cousins, but like you know they're Tongxiang. Yeah. He um, yeah, and did he really have much of a platform other than um, well, stabilizing cross strait relations? But most of it was just, hey, I'm not Chen Shui Bian. <laughs> it's kind of like Joe Biden nowadays. It's like, hey, well, <laughs> I, I'm I'm not Donald Trump. <laughs> Well, okay. I also remember because my angel was a relatively young, youngish, good-looking guy. So I, I, I read reports about his how votes he... among female voters was higher than among male voters. Yeah, and they think it's because of his looks. Yes, yes, yes. I, he, was, I he was a good. He was a good-looking guy. Yeah, yeah. Basically, um, Chen Shui Bian embezzled too much money, so he was actually ostracized by the DPP and ended up being. Ended up like quitting the party along uh, along with his wife. His wife was also his wife and his son in law. They were all heavily involved in embezzling. So um, I guess um, next time we can start talking about Ma Ying-jeou and um, Tsai Ing-wen and the um, the Sunflower Movement. But today I think we should, we can end on um just discussing about like the changes because now this is stuff that's happened in my lifetime. Yes. So it's things that I've seen. So like, is there anything you specifically want to talk about or touch on that we've covered and just try to put like a more human side to these um stories we've been telling? Yeah, I, I like would like to hear more about you know from your the, your personal stories. You know how you experience Taiwan. I think that kind of kind of make it more personal. 
to uh, more relatable for for people. For a lot of listeners. Yes. Okay, so I mean, um, it's the first time I went to Taiwan, I didn't really have memories. I was like nine months old. How old? Was, my, how, which year was this? Do you remember approximately? Well, if like, I was nine months, I was born in March, so it was like the end of 1993. Ah, okay. So and, this um, is the last. Uh, so this is uh, near the end of Li Denghui's first term, right? Or 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 in the middle. I forgot which number term. Uh, because yeah. His first term was in 88. 88. Ah, he, yeah, he, right. he was three. Oh, terms weren't really a thing because it, he wasn't directly elected yet. Yeah, exactly. So exactly. Basically, um, it was in the middle of his leadership. Yeah. But um, th- I guess more towards the beginning. But my mom wanted to like you know show me to my um grandparents and her grandmother. My grandparents were gonna visit the U.S., but my great grandfather like fell down the stairs and died like a few months before I was born, so that that was canceled. Um, so I went to Taiwan like a lot as a kid, like maybe like every summer or so, and it was always like a few months at the same time before because I wasn't like going to school, and like if it, when it was preschool, I could just you know it wasn't a big deal to just not go. So um. Yeah, it was. I remember distinctly. I didn't know why at the point, at, at that point yet. But I remember like my mom's friends in America who were also from Taiwan spoke predominantly in Mandarin to each other. Whereas like my mom's like relatives in Taiwan, they would speak Mandarin to like my generation and my cousins. But then when they spoke to each other, they spoke in their own dialect. I noticed that. So then I kind of picked, I picked up on the dialect too. I mean, I don't, it it wasn't my first language because my dad doesn't speak it. So then it wasn't like the, it wasn't the, um, the lingua franca in my household, but it was, I I have, I've had enough exposure to it. I can, I can understand it well and speak it like, okay, not the best. I end up sticking a lot of Mandarin into it. Wait, your, your dad, your dad also speak Korean, right? Yeah. And he speaks some Shandonghua or Jiaodonghua. Oh right, right. That's because that's his home, uh, home language, oh, right? Yeah, 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 mother tongue. Yeah, but um, so I'm like the first. I'm I'm the first person in my family who speaks stand, standard Mandarin as my first language. On either side, but um, yeah. So I I, I just kind of knew that there was this guy named Li Denghui. Didn't really have much of an opinion much of an opinion about him but then what really struck me was in 2000 when there was the election i mean it was a big deal because my mom's a benson ren so then she was like all for chen Shui-bian. and my mom's not even like a taiwanese separatist she just liked the idea of having like finally having a like a taiwanese president or yeah. leader you know i mean Li Denghui was but then Li Denghui wasn't really elected by the people he was in 1996 but Come on, like, it's because of his popularity from before when he wasn't, when he wasn't directly elected. So then, yeah, well, I remember um watching it on TV because we had satellite satellite TV, so we got like Taiwanese news and stuff like that. And it was a huge deal. Like when when Chen Shui Bian won, there were so there were so many riots, and then like on like political talk shows where people called in live, they were like cursing, like saying things like, uh. Which in um, it's like Hokkien for like fuck your mother KMT. On TV, wow. It was live TV, so they can't censor it. Uh, nice. Yeah. It's one of those things where like you know immigrant parents hope that their kids don't learn these like learn this sort of vocabulary because they're like, well, they're away from they're they're away from the country now, so then they won't be exposed to that. Now they were wrong. And then um. <laughs> So I was just asking, like, I, I would ask my mom, like, how come there are riots and stuff? And she would explain, well, the KM, like, KMT was, like, really, the KMT was really mean in the past. Mm. And how, like, it was really mean to Taiwanese people. And um, how they, they, they um, looked after Wai Sung Ren more and, like, had just basically stuff that we were talking about but even then my mom still identifies as chinese and she was she's never really been much of a separatist mm-hmm. yeah so it's kind of so then like growing up i've been like I, I've, I've been 
brought up as like you know told that I'm Chinese. Like, uh, so and also because like, your mom kind of left Taiwan like uh, before nineties, right? Or yes, she came to America in nineteen eighty-three. Yeah, because back then when that's when most people in Taiwan still identify as Chinese. <laughs> yes, I feel like if she never left Taiwan by two thousand, she would have stopped calling herself Chinese, probably. Maybe, yeah. Like my um, like her older brother, is like a Taiwan independence fascist. This is your so this my, is your my, cousin. Yeah. No, no, my 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 mom's my uncle, my mom's brother, my mom's older oh. brother. Yeah, I see, I see. Okay. Yeah, he like when I was little, he was he was he was telling me stuff like how about like we're all like we're not Chinese anymore. Like we're at this point, we're not Chinese anymore. And he told me to not call mainland China the mainland, but to call it China. He says to call it mainland is to imply that we're the same country. Ah, uh. yeah. And like I go to his house, he has like all these like DPP banners and like say no to China like banners, <laughs> and it's 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 it, it's 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 quite hilarious. <laughs> um, it's just kind of it, so this this sort of divide has always been like. In my family, I also have like my mom's younger brother. He's like a centrist. Like in the eighties, he was pro like Dang Wai and pro DPP. Back when it was taboo to be, um, you know, pro DPP. But then like now he's like super anti Tsai Ing Wen. So he's like Why? he's like he's basically a centrist. Like he's you know he's pro- promised a lot of these things and then they don't deliver. And he's he says that. It seems to him that the DPP is bringing Taiwan closer to war, and he said mm-hmm. that like he says like you know you look at some like we're really lucky that we haven't experienced hot war in our lifetimes. He, he says you look at a lot of war torn countries. It's like these the, the people there like the children they don't have opportunities, and he says he doesn't want that to happen in Taiwan. And he says that the DPP because of its opportunism is bringing Taiwan closer to closer to that. I don't. Th- I don't think things are that dire, to be honest. No, but, me neither. But um, I think he's like, he was like pro Han Guoyu this time. Mm. I think just because of um, he's a centrist and he's like, I guess he just wants stability and yeah, Tsai Ing hasn't really impressed him. What? Well, uh... <laughs> he was like he was pro Chen Shui but then like he voted against Chen Shui and he supported Ma Ying Zhou, but then he supported Tsai Ing at first, but now he's like anti Tsai Ing so he's like. You know, typical wavering centrist. <laughs> he's also worked as um, he's worked as um assistant as an assistant for um city council members, city council men and women, uh. for both parties in his city. So he has like a lot of insider information on the DPP uh. and on the KMT. Like I, I remember when I was um uh, when I was when I was a. Uh, Fifteen. I actually hung out in this one KMT office in Tainan when he was helping when he was uh, the assistant of a of a candidate for um, city councilwoman. Yeah, I remember that. But then, like, and then he became. So then, I, I well, to be fair like to we... your uncle, I mean, the Taiwan leader leaders. Haven't really been impressive <laughs> since exactly. since you don't worry right since the election it, it hasn't been hasn't been anyone that really stood out or or really delivered on their promises. Yeah. like he's not really a communist, but then he'll hear me talking about some things and he'll just you can you can tell he kind of just agrees with with a bit of it. Yeah, with a good bit of it. Yeah, but um, what else? I remember um, like even even when Chen Shui-bian was leader. It was still normal for people to just refer to mainland China as Dalu or mainland. Right. But in recent years, like if you call it Dalu, some people will just like kind of out you as like a um, anti Taiwanese. Oh wow. Now it's like so, now it's like you're supposed to call it Zhongguo. Wow. The middle ground is to call it Zhongguo Dalu, which is like mainland China. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I still I still call it Dalu. I still haven't been canceled yet, but I think I, I think it's because um, with my music career and stuff, like I I'm able to back my claims up. That <laughs> I think I think liberals just don't really want to like. They know how to deal with like, K, like pro KMT people, 
and they know how to deal with like the typical you know mainlander who approaches these issues from like a nationalistic standpoint but i don't think they know how to approach these things from like a like a marxist leninist standpoint so they just kind of don't fuck with me <laughs> well that's why i have you on the show <laughs> because yes um because we really value your unique insight and perspective and, and i think your personal experience kind of really helped out flesh out that even more um you know we have already been talking for hours and and next time when we uh you know get together i like to you know really talk about the changes i think like what i think i want to talk about is also like the we kind of touch on it briefly about the the neoliberal econo uh, liberal economic liberalization on taiwan because that kind of lead to some of the issues faced by the taiwan youth today right because yes. you know you, because right now a lot of problem faced by youth in taiwan is not that dissimilar from the issue being faced by like the millennials or the zoomers in in, in us and the west it's it's the hollowing out of the economy um you know the the the, 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 the increasing stratification in society yes. and yes. that you know the rich get richer poor gets poor and and just like limited economic opportunity for the new generation and, and kind I of think, like the point of the sunflower movement but then they turned it into just like an anti-china movement yes yes that, that's the history of taiwan right every domestic... every time there's like something that's like remotely class conscious okay we're gonna turn it into id poll yes yes i mean that's that's not itself is not limited to taiwan oh well, yeah yeah, yeah. happened globally in many many society in these kind of uh liberal so-called liberal democracies and and what we'll get so an interesting I, next episode because we'll get to talk about like some of the new parties that emerged but the, yes. we'll also talk about how taiwan's political system isn't really isn't really catered towards third parties and um usually if you if you're a third party and you want to make it big you have to join either coalition the, the yeah. pan green coalition led by the dpp yeah. or the Pan Blue Coalition led by the KMT. And these aren't official coalitions, but they're 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 pretty much there. Yeah, the 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 the, the thing the thing the ironic thing is that kind of the two party divide in Taiwan is increasingly similar to the two two so called two party divide in U.S. Right? Yes. Where you yes. have this, these uh, parties. It's the perfect way to solidify class rule to present like these alternatives, and yeah, you, you can shift blame on each other. But at the end yes. of the day, no matter who wins or loses the same people win and lose yes and and these this it's it's uh it's like these two parties representing different oligarchic interests uh fighting each other for for greater share of control while uh you know hyping up kind of like the the, the identity politics and, and 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 you know the social the divide on social and cultural issues um uh, and 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 while per basically perpetuating the status quo, right, which is increasingly heading down to ec more economic stagnation. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, just a second. Let me answer this real quick. Hey, babe, I'm still in the middle of the call. Can you just uh, send me a text message? Okay. 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 Talk to you later. Okay. Um, all right, so I guess it's time to wrap it up. Uh, this, uh, we know we have, have, uh, we've been talking for two and a half hours and we're just, we're just getting through the nineties, right? And, and a little no, bit. No, we're, of, we're, we're through the early, we're through the two, we're up to 2008 now. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're, we're okay. 2000, but, but next time we meet, like I said, I wanted to talk a little bit more about, uh, the, the economic policies uh, on Taiwan since, uh, you know, since the century. Since, oh, I mean, it started a little bit from Li Denghui, right? So starting from Li Denghui through Chen yeah. Shui-bian era at, down to the present and how the, you know, that kind of impacted the, the, the prospect of uh, the new generation on Taiwan and how that, you know, it caused the po politics to to evolve and, and then we can talk about the new parties and the sunflower movement and all that because it, everything is kind of interconnected right the politics the economics and which is why Taiwan, we're 
this series started from prehistoric times and it tries to cover a little bit of everything to give a better context. Yes, yes. And I think we have, uh, and thanks to you, I think we, we have been flesh out quite a, quite a bit on the details of the Taiwan political development. So uh, thank you very much, Xiang Yu, again for joining the show. And we, I look forward to talking to you next time on uh you know the the more modern taiwan yes it's like all, always a pleasure to be on okay. this is like my only social activity after the whole lockdown thing so <laughs> looking forward to the next time we talk hey anytime anytime i'm i'm in bali where we're in the same situ same boat here so uh it's always a pleasure and thanks everyone for tuning in until next time bye bye all right bye Yo, Brett salutes ransom notes. This is for the people. Fuck the U.S. of America. Say's Pongyo, say's Dijen. Woman Nungfo, the Jose Wendy Er with the Jishiren. Say the Mungyo, say the Li Ren. Say's a Ji Yifen, the Tung Do, the Xi Sheng. Say's Pongyo, say's Dijen. Woman Nungfo, the Jose Wendy Er with the Jishiren. Say the Mungyo, say the Li Ren. Say's a Ji Yifen. 当时的记忆已经分子 但其实是我们迷失一段当垂的历史而第一次并其一次被压迫的各国人民自以为人你却把压迫者奉作生命不分明侵略和防御只要求无条件的和平得当奴隶主的肯定不我不被他们尊敬谁是朋友谁是敌